Milken West Orange to our Tuesday, April 28, 2020 Township Council meeting. Madam Clerk. This is to inform the general public that this meeting is being held in compliance with Section 5 of the Open Public Meetings Act, Chapter 231, Public Law 1975. The annual notice was emailed to the Star Ledger and filed in the Township Clerk's Office on October 31st, 2019 and published in the West Orange Chronicle on November 7th, 2019. Councilman Garino? Present. Councilman Krakowiak? Present. Councilwoman Matute Brown? Present. Councilwoman McCartney? Present. Council President Casalino? Present. Thank you, Madam Clerk. And again, welcome West Orange. Uh, sorry we're late uh, to, to the, our online meeting. We, I'd like to um, introduce Laura Graftiza, for those of you who were, not, who were not with us at the last meeting, she is our moderator. Uh, she's from our school district and we thank her for moderating our meeting for us. And um, you have access to her um, and she will, when it comes time to public comment, uh, she will uh, introduce you into our meeting. So we hope everything goes smooth this uh, evening and I uh, hope you all have some patience with us. Um, I like to start off the meeting, and I hope this isn't going to continue, um, but since the last meeting, we lost um, an, uh, over another 50 residents in the township. And so I like to start off the meeting with saying, uh, having a moment of silence, thinking of all their families, them, and so many who the sick and suffering still in our township. So we could please bow our heads for a minute. Thank you. It's been a um, tough couple of weeks for us here in the township. And um, we wanted to bring to you tonight some important information. We feel it's important. We know a lot of you are stuck at home. Um, some of you, many of you are, are not on the internet. So this will appear um, on TV 36 and 45 if you have uh, Fios. And we just want to give you some good information to help you navigate uh, through these tough times. Um, last time we had Assemblyman John McKeeing on and he was very helpful. And so I have posted tonight uh, his information. So for those who are still having problems seeking an appointment and need some assistance, please feel free to reach out to his office. He is there to help. And also, um, if you're having issues, if you're a business owner and you're trying to uh, get a small business loan and you're having issues uh, on that, with that, please feel free to um, go to the website or call our assemblyman's uh, phone number for, for assistance. Because we, we know these are tough times and to navigate, we know the website this week uh, has been jammed up. Um, but we're here to assist you. I know also uh, our downtown director, Megan Brill, has reached out to many of our businesses in the community. And again, we're, we're here to assist. So anything we could do for you, um, please let us know and reach out to these other, um, other sites. And um, tonight we have, some, um, we have a few guests this evening to help us assist with information. Uh, before they get started, um, I just want to put up here on the site, we have information for COVID. Um, you, sometimes it's hard to get through to the health department. Uh, someone's not always there on the phone, but you could leave a message, but we have the website that you could reach out to that's on the screen. We have the medical COVID hotline numbers. So again, please reach out. We have the information here and we want you to be able to get all your questions answered. And at any given time, you can call and reach out to one of us. Uh, we're on www.westorange council at, uh, I'm sorry, council at westorange.org. And please reach out to us at any given time. Uh, next, I would like to introduce our police chief and operations uh, director, Chief Abbott. And he's going to give us an update. We've had uh, some unfortunate, some scams have been going on in the community. Um, unfortunately, when we have times of 
need, there's always folks out there that uh, are bad actors who want to take advantage of situations and advantage of the public. And Chief is going to give us uh, some important updates. So Chief Abbott, thank you for coming on tonight and we hope you're doing well. Thank you, Madam Council President. Um, before I jump into that, I just want to put a plug in for uh, understand Millennium Strategies is up for renewal uh, tonight. And, uh, out of all the different vendors that I've dealt with as it relates to uh, grant writing, they've really uh, been head and shoulders above everybody else. Uh, they didn't ask for that plug, but uh, seeing it on there, I just want to, I felt compelled to get in there. So, for the purposes of tonight, um, there's a couple of social media posts we have out, and we're also running it on TV 3645. Um, we call it our Lock It or Lose It campaign. Please remember that most of the vehicles that are burglarized in West Orange and everywhere else in the country, for that matter, are left unlocked, and there's valuables located in the vehicle. So if somebody looks in the window, they see a laptop or a handbag or whatever, Car's not locked, it's an easy target. Probably have a better chance of hitting the lottery than catching a crime like that in progress. That's the first thing that residents ask for is, well, can we get more patrols in the area? It's not unique to any certain area of town, it's all over town when it happens. And you know, fortunately it hasn't been that bad, although that's one of the expected spikes and it's one of the ongoing spikes around the state. So it's one of the ones we're anticipating, but it hasn't been too bad. We have made a couple of arrests. We actually made one tonight along with South Orange Police down on the borderline. Um, so kudos to uh, South Orange PD for following somebody that they recognize to be a habitual burglar of motor vehicles and uh, making that arrest. Um, it was Detective Hunt and Lieutenant uh, Brian McGuire over there in South Orange PD. If any of you listeners know those gentlemen, uh, I want to personally thank them. Uh, second issue is the clerk is not issuing any, any peddler's licenses in township right now. So if anybody knocks at your door trying to peddle anything, please dial the non-emergency number 973-325-4000. Um, if you are more scared or you think it's any type of emergency, please dial 911. Last thing is um, the scams that are going on. So between the text messaging, emails, and social media, there's a number of phishing scams. Um, my quote for that and for everybody that's listening is don't click the link. Uh, you may be told that someone you've been in contact with has tested positive. They want you to click a link, don't do it. Um, it may say you have the ability to claim your stimulus check from the IRS, don't click the link. They may maybe disinformation about self-diagnosis protocols and breathing exercises, fake cures and tests. Again, don't click the link. Um, the United States Postal Service has some concerns with uh, general thefts of mail, forced entries into cluster box units, such as in apartment buildings where the uh, mailboxes are all together, and they're concerned about fraudulent change of address and hold mail activity. So if you see anything like that, you're not getting your mail for some reason, please reach out to the United States Post Office right away. Um, be careful of uh, people are working from home, they're out of work, they're, they may see um, applying for jobs online, work from the security and safety of your own home. Most of these are scams. They may be games that ask for a number of uh, questions that ask what year you graduated high school, um, you know, different things like that that are typical security questions in your bank accounts and things. Don't supply any of that. Never pay fees up front for any services, for employment, for anything. Uh, there's uh, a lot of romance scams going on right now. People are uh, locked away. They haven't been out on a date. They're a little bit lonely. Very easy to get tricked into. Uh, a lot of fake PPE, personal protection equipment scams going on about buying masks, um, different things like that. You really have to be careful. And, you know, that's our, that's our new uh, saying, don't click the link. So uh, that's about all I have. I just ask everybody to uh, be very cautious. Always please, please, please call us. I get too many times over the years I've been told I didn't want to bother you. I knew how busy you were, so I didn't call. That's what we're there for. Please call us. 973-325-4000, uh, non-emergency, 911 in emergency. We're more than happy to take your call and we will assist you. I wish everybody uh, continued health and uh, 
our deepest condolences for those of you who've lost friends and loved ones. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Warren, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, good. Okay. Yeah, you're left I, on mute. I, I thought I muted myself. Thank, thank no, no, you, Chief. Good. And uh, at the end of all our guests, after they speak, I'm going to circle on back. And if any of my colleagues have any questions or comments for all our guest speakers today. So first, uh, I just want to get through each guest. And uh, next up, um, also I neglected to mention, uh, Chief Abbott is a member of our uh, uh, of our emergency management team for this crisis. He's on the COVID team. So is our fire chief, uh, Anthony Vecchio. And uh, Chief Vecchio, we welcome you here this evening. Uh, we appreciate you coming in. You're gonna give us a little um, information about our fire department this evening. And uh, we appreciate all the, the hours you have been putting in lately as well. So. Chief Vecchio. Thank you, Council President. Uh, I did prepare a little something. Uh, thank you, Council President, and to the Council members for inviting me tonight. Uh, since I know you've asked me to come and answer some questions, I thought I'd, I'd give a brief overview of where the fire department currently stands during the COVID-19 crisis. Hopefully this can satisfy some, if not all of those questions. Uh, the COVID-19 scenario is the largest scale communicable disease event that we've ever seen. Uh, however, the fire department has taken somewhat the same preventative approach responding to this pandemic as we would with influenza or any other viral disease, but obviously with a different level of vigilance. Given the many early unknowns regarding the transmission of the virus and length of time it lives on surfaces, uh, our use of personal protective equipment has increased and the level to which we decontaminate our ambulances and fire vehicles has also, <coughs> excuse me, been modified. Early in the crisis, we had some difficulty with procurement of PPE and decontamination supplies. However, with the help of the West Orange OEM and the County OEM, as well as many of our, our committed vendors, uh, we're currently stocked to keep us protected for at least the next month. Our call, call volume has fluctuated over the past six to seven weeks. We've seen an uptick, tick, obviously, in EMS responses. About three weeks ago, it started. Uh, we staffed an extra ambulance to compensate for the additional calls. Uh, the COVID responses and transports tend to take longer overall, uh, and we were beginning to see the stacking of calls, which is something we, we never want to do, where people are actually waiting uh, for service. The additional ambulance helped to, to alleviate that issue. As predicted, uh, many, approximately 175 of our EMS responses since March 1st have been to the 11 uh, private long-term care facilities in town. Internally, the fire department's gone, not gone unscathed by the virus. At our most challenging time, the department had 23 of our members out. The majority of these members were either positive for COVID-19, symptomatic of the virus, or isolated due to an exposure. Thankfully, most of those members have returned to full duty. Uh, however, we do still have several out. In total, we've had seven who have tested positive and well over uh, 20 or so who are either symptomatic or had to be put off duty for self-isolation due to an exposure. As I did several weeks ago, I'd like to offer the community some recommendations regarding the COVID-19 event. Since most people have been overwhelmed with information on this virus, we continue to recommend the following information we continue to recommend following the information distributed only by the Centers for Disease Control, the New Jersey Department of Health, and the West Orange Health Department. Too much inaccurate information circulates through social media, and I encourage everyone to vet your sources. Also, if you or anyone in your family circle believes that they are symptomatic, as defined by the CDC, we ask that you contact your personal physicians first for direction. If you believe your symptoms require being treated at a hospital, we ask that only patients who are non-ambulatory, meaning they can't walk, and without a means of transport, call 911. The overall goal here is to limit the exposure of the virus to others, and that includes our emergency responders. That's my statement. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Chief. And I believe we have another slide for you. Well, these are slides that we, um, we put together to uh, be pushed out through social media throughout the last couple of months um, as things um, changed. And um, for example, the slide you're looking at now is, is uh, we were looking for donations. 
uh, thankfully, we'll, we'll still take donations, but uh, up at the OEM, 25 Mount Pleasant Place. Uh, but uh, we, have, we have been able to procure some, some PPE. Our PPE is a little different than what other people uh, would use. Um, so, so we have, thankfully, OEMs worked real hard uh, and we've been, we've been able to, to secure some, some things. But we still, uh, we still can use some of the things you see up on the screen. Hand sanitizer is, is uh, you know, always welcome. Um, so any donations are appreciated. Thank you. And then we have our bravest. <laughs> there they are. <laughs> Thanks yeah. to these guys. Everybody's working real hard. Um, I've been giving a lot of attaboys and attagirls um, to everyone because, uh, you know, it's a tough time. There are a lot of unknowns. And, um, and thankfully, our, our, our folks are, are approaching it head on. They're, they're, um, we've got it down now. Um, and um, we're here to serve. Well, thank, thank you for your service and, uh, and for the enormous hours of work time that you've all been putting in, Chief. Um, with this um, crisis comes a change in our services. And one of our services that has been altered recently is our recycling, the way we recycle. Uh, hasn't been altered too terribly um, to the point where we have to separate things and rotate alternate weeks. And tonight we have our recycling coordinator, Nick Solis here to go over those changes and, and to talk about a few other items uh, on his list. So thank you, thank you, Nick, for coming in this evening to talk to us. And uh, I'll let you start your presentation. Madam President, we actually dropped uh, Nick's, uh, Nick's uh, connection, unfortunately. Oh, um, okay. So I do not have him here. I was just waiting to see if he was going to uh, come back on. Okay. Um, and I'm checking now to see if maybe he called in from as an attendee and I do not see him there. So hopefully he, uh, oh, I do see him. He did hold on, please. Let me see if I can move <laughs> him to talk. <laughs> Nick, if you can, uh, you'll see a, a prompt on your screen. There you go. Nick, do you have us? Mm -hmm. Nick, Elise? Is he there? Uh, he was. And I'm here. Oh, there he is. There we go. <laughs> we have you in uh, voice only right now. Oh, okay. Um, are you able to see the screen at all? I'm yes. able to see the screen, correct. Okay, great. Okay, great. So we can follow along with the slides. I see Anthony there. <laughs> you could do worse, Nick. <laughs> I could do, yes. Okay, thank you, Nick. Here you go. Okay. So Nick, you could explain, I had a, a little intro for you, but maybe you can explain the, how we have to alternate and uh, with our recycling. And uh, this week was the cardboard newspaper and um, yeah. That's well, it. We started it, as I am, my understanding was we started it last week on the 20th, which was the same three day pickup that didn't change, which is Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday with the three zones. Okay, and we started with our bottles. Yes, some of our residents were confused, but this is only going back to 2013 when we first left the dual stream program, which was separating alternate weeks. Okay, and we started our single stream programs, which is all in one. Okay, so here's what's happening now. Last week it was all your Co-mingled. Co-mingled means your glass bottles, your steel cans, your aluminum cans, uh, number fives, which are a lot of your uh, uh, yogurt tubs, your uh, pot cheese tubs, <laughs> which all have to be rinsed out, and that's your co-mingled product. Okay, this week we started with the cardboard, mixed paper, junk mail, clean paper, newspaper which is all your paper material. Okay, so what we're doing now is every other week, it's gonna alternate. So the first two weeks, which is last, last Monday, the 20th, was your co-mingled. 
So if people remember commingle, which is plastics, cans, bottles, glass, so on and so forth. And the second week, which is the alternating week, would be your paper products, which is your cardboard, your um, junk mail, magazines, clean paper, and newspaper. So that's the really the important thing to understand now. Until we get everything squared away with our MRFs. Our MRFs are our end markets that do most of the separating of our single stream program. Okay, which most of them were all shut down. This is the reason why we had to go back to dual stream. From single stream back to dual stream. We had to separate the product because his assembly line that took care of the single stream program, which involves a group of people together, weren't able because our governor wanted distancing, so they weren't able to work. So they had to shut that part of the plant down. So, but they kept open the dual stream program. Did, am I making myself clear or? Absolutely. And so next week, Lauren, if you could go to the next slide. So next week, then we switch to the commingle. No, next week it'll be paper products. Uh, commingle, I'm sorry, you're right. That, that's okay. And uh, how long will this run until right now, Nick? I would say, I think the whole month of May, possibly. And it depends what our governor, if he lets the businesses start doing the work again, letting people in, you know, but commingle, like I said, there's people right next to each other pulling contaminated material out of the single stream product. Single stream product has everything in it. So okay. that's the problem. And, um, and Lauren, if you go to the next slide and if folks don't want to wait the every other week, they can bring everything still up to our recycling center, correct? Uh, yes, our recycling environmental center, which is our drop off depot. Yes, they can bring all the plastics. They can bring all the cardboard. They can bring all your steel, uh, all your paper products. Uh, and actually, they can also pick up some emulsion soil there while they're there. Okay. That is great. So that's open every day from 7.30 to 4.30, Monday through Friday. Saturdays, it's 7.30 to 4 o'clock. Okay. And uh, okay, my show ID. Our residents must show ID that they're from the town of West Orange. That's great. And then I know you want to talk a little bit about these masks and gloves that people are not uh, discarding properly. Well, that's a big problem. What I'm seeing and what I'm hearing, okay, a lot of the people are following the rules. They're wearing a mask. Okay, some of them are homemade masks and they're wearing gloves. And what's happening is either they're throwing them in a carriage, on the ground, so on and so forth. These should go into our waste stream. Any garbage can that you see, which takes waste, that's where they should be placed. They should be not thrown around because what it really does, it's still there that anybody that picks them up can catch the coronavirus. Okay, thank you. And what about litter in general? Well, litter, uh, everything is shut down. Now it's up to our own people, okay, to do their own liver litter pickup. Okay, if they see some papers, cans, bottles, so on and so forth, they should actually, if they're walking the street, pick it up, put it in a plastic bag, and put it in the right location, either recycling or waste. Because at this present time, we do not have any groups going out doing different sections in the town, which we do. Okay, Clean Communities Program, we have Cub Scouts, actually the, the hotels, the people volunteer, beauty salons, they all volunteer to do this pickup. And we do it frequently, let me say it that way. So now it's up to us, the residents, to pull together and keep our streets 
clean, our parks clean by picking this material up. Great. Th th thank you. Thank you, Nick. Is there anything else that we should know at this point or? Uh, yes, on one note, I was looking at our agenda, okay, and I see that uh, Millennium is up for their contract again. I just want to say that they are tremendous people. They helped us, uh, Susan, myself, Joe McCartney, John Linson, retrieve a lot of money through grants, and they work together with us very closely. Great. Thank, thank, thank you, Nick, and thank you for coming on this evening. Um, I'm going to move uh, next to, and then we're going to go back and, um, you know, ask all of your questions uh, or, or may have a comment for you, but I'm going to move on to Cynthia Cumming. Okay. Uh, Cynthia manages the Holy Trinity Food Pantry, as well being the uh, POI for the school district. And I just wanted to bring her on. Um, this week to talk about what um, has been going on at the food pantry. Um, a lot of great volunteers have been down there, have been assisting her. It's been a great need. As the weeks have been going by, there's been more and more need mm -hmm. and more and more families need to be fed. So she's gonna talk a little bit about the service there. And uh, also Cynthia, if you could mention too, um, what the school district is doing as well, uh, that okay. would be great. Okay. Thank you. Well, hi, everybody. And thank you for having me tonight. Uh, we've generally we are open five times a month toward the end of the month, we have registered clients and they come once a month, they get to shop for what they need. And uh, we average about 130 families to 150 families a month up to like five, let's say 500 people total of, of people that get fed and today for example 145 people came for food uh and you know representing you know many hundreds of of people that are in need um we're kind of heading into this crunch period of trying to maintain uh it, it's less of a money supply and more of a, a food sourcing supply but you know we're doing our best working with the food bank uh, working with some other organizations, um, you know, we've been getting individual donations and, and that's all great. Uh, we're, we've also been working with the Department of Senior Citizens with Laura Van Dyke and they sent us the information and we'll shop and deliver for seniors and high risk residents that can't get out. And Michelle, you've been one of the people that's been helping us with our deliveries every week. So you know how it can get, it can get a little crazy. And we've had a youth, like a group of young people from town, the pandemic task force or something, and, and uh, they've been helping us. And then last week when our numbers started to go up so much that we had to start getting more food than we normally do at the food bank, the West Orange police stepped in and we've been able to use their uh their trailer for some trips and it and they've been um, helping us at the door and with bagging and you know we're we're just doing our best to get through on a week-to-week -week basis right now and, and anyone can come down to the food bank in need on yeah those days yeah we're, we're not line. limiting that yeah we're not limiting that i mean normally like i said people need to register but right now, uh, all those compliance requirements have been waived by the Community Food Bank and the USDA and the state food allocation program. So they can come. I mean, I'd rather they were coming once a week. Uh, I, I don't, you know, we, we can't control how many times people are coming or, um, or the number of people coming. But today was our largest day so far. So. And, and can you talk a little bit about what the school district has been doing for the, for yeah. the families? For the, well, the first the week, yeah, the first week when they went into the, like the forced vacation week, we provided the school district with 153 bags of food, like lunch related products to help the, 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 the families in need for that week. Uh, and then our food service provider, Machio's, ha, is now providing for free and reduced lunch students, like a, a breakfast and a lunch that gets uh, 
they I think they send it out to schools uh, a couple of times a week and people parents can come and pick them up. Uh, they also started their own little food pantry. Um, Dr. Cascon was very <laughs> enthusiastic about also having some food on hand if anybody showed up at central office. And so they have they have some boxes of food up there if people need to stop by. Well, that's great. I think we have a slide next of where someone could send a donation for the mm -hmm. food pantry. Yeah. Yeah, that's that is correct. Uh, and they can uh, contact me or they can uh, if they need if they want to make a food donation uh we're open this week tuesday third well we are open today we're open thursday friday 10 to 12. if they want to stop by with a donation or contact me they should have my info and and, and what is something that they usually could need that you well this week you know it, it varies from week to week this week we totally we ran out of rice today we ran out of pasta we need pasta sauce what uh no i got that I got jelly today at the food bank. Uh, but I would say those three items, we're going to run out of juice, but I'm not going to worry about that. But I would say for this week, my crunch is, is rice, pasta, and pasta sauce. Great. Thank, thank you very much, Cynthia. You're welcome. And, and I know you, Chris Bimbinski, um, I don't know if you want to mention some of your volunteers. and Yeah, my folks from, from United Presbyterian Church up in uh, Saint, the St. Saint Cloud area, my husband. They, everybody's been, you know, we've all been working really, really hard to try to keep up with the demand. So, and, and thanks to the community for their generosity too. And, and I know you've been going uh, seven days a week and, and I know the yeah. community really appreciates that. So, so thank you. You're welcome. So, um, with our four guests, I would like to open up comments and questions to my colleagues because I know they uh, would, would like to speak. So, Councilman Garino. Thank you, Council President. Thank you very much. And thank you to our four guests today. Thank you for your updates and information and your continued service to the West Orange community and our residents. Um, you know, to Chief Vecchio and Chief Abbott, um, I know all my colleagues and I wish the best for our rank and file and uh, for the men and women of the West Orange Fire Department and Police Department. I have a question for both of you concerning uh, shift details. Um, with the number of um, personnel either being sick or out of commission, how are the extension of any hours for the shifts and how are the uh, rank and file holding up? Either, either chief can answer my question. Jim, you wanna go first? Sure. sure. So, we changed our schedule around to 12 hour days, split into six teams, and we put everybody back in uniform from the rank of captain on down. Uh, they still fulfill their traditional responsibility they were assigned to prior to the pandemic. However, they work for three 12 hour days, filed by six days off where they're on call for, um, I believe it's 18 hours, uh, a pay, 18 hours and 40 minutes of pay period. Um, the pay period doesn't necessarily line up. That's two weeks back with the nine-day cycle. So there's some overlap, but for the most part, um, that sums it up. It's worked tremendously well. Um, gives guys plenty of rest in between after coming off three consecutive 12-hour days. And we've had one instance of a police officer testing positive for COVID-19 that is on that schedule. And uh, my understanding, he comes back uh, tomorrow, actually. So things have booking up and working out, um, kept in contact with him intermittently. And, uh, you know, he was, he sounded pretty bad there for a while, but um, he sounded much better the other day when I spoke with him. Okay. Thank you, Chief Abbott. Chief, Chief Ekio? Uh, we've not changed our schedule. Uh, we entertained it uh, about a month ago. Uh, I talked to some other chiefs in neighboring communities, uh, trying to do the same thing that Chief Abbott was doing and, 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 um, you know, not not of as much contact. Uh, it didn't it didn't suit us. Um, we still have the twenty four hour, seventy two hour schedules, so uh, there is that that um, automatic distance with the with the schedule that we have. Um, as I said in, in my earlier statement, we 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 did have uh, a few weeks ago uh, a bit of a, a I'll call it a little bit of an outbreak within our within our ranks. Uh, we managed to get through it. Uh, with some um, 
you know, we, we've, we've denied any non-scheduled personal leaves. So uh, everyone's, everyone's coming to work unless they're, they're sick. So um, for the most part, so uh, that's helped. And then we filled in some of the gaps with overtime and, and uh, thanks to, to, uh, I can't not give credit to Susan Iovino. She's been in addition to helping out, um, uh, helping out in addition to, to handling all the contact tracing and, and everything she's doing for the, the thousand plus cases in West Orange. She's also helped out the police department and the fire department with our situation, with our own staff to try to keep, um, keep everything moving forward. Uh, and she's, she's kept track with any of our, our exposures or, or uh, positive um, members and told them when they can come back to work after. So it was, she's been a, she's been a blessing, uh, but everything's worked out. Thank you. Uh, and I just have one question for, for both of our chiefs. Um, how are our resources holding up? And what I mean by our resources, how are our vehicles and our equipment holding up to the uh, change in environment, you know, with increased uh, calls for, uh, you know, medical emergency, uh, police responsing? How is our uh, resources holding up to the extent of that? Do you want me to go first again, Tom? Sure. Uh, sure. So it's kind of, um, a paradox with this, you know, Tony's calls for service are probably way up with all the illness. Our calls for service are way down. Um, we've been able to keep the building and the, the vehicles uh, decontaminated the, by the DPW um, staff uh, multiple times a day. Those, those guys said from the inception, those guys have been fantastic. So, uh, you know, Joe Morello, Louis Reynolds, and I know I'm leaving some folks out there and I don't mean to, it's not intentional. They've been, they've been great. I mean, they, I can't tell you how much they've done for us. They've been fantastic. Okay. Thank you, chief. And the fire department's okay. Uh, yeah. We, I mean, we're, um, our call volume is, is not as, as, um, extreme as you might think. Yes. We had an uptick in our EMS uh, runs, but to Jimmy's point, we've, uh, we've actually seen a bit of a decline in our, our fire related calls. I think people are, are kind of hunkered down and, and um, they're, they're not interested in having people come into their, their homes. Uh, so certain, certain calls um, that they might have otherwise called the fire department for, they're, they're trying to figure out on their own. Um, and as I said before, when we did uh, see the, the spike in, in COVID related EMS calls, we did staff another ambulance um, because those, those calls require, um, uh, you know, uh, different, different levels of PPE uh, that they have to don before the call. Uh, and addition, every call requires full decontamination of the ambulance, which takes a lot of time. So um, we were able to manage it. Uh, and and I, I give credit to the, to the guys and gals in my department. They've, they've worked hard. Um, a lot of them have worked long hours, especially during that, that period where we had a lot out on isolation. Uh, we were asking, you know, uh, people to work 24-hour shifts and then sometimes work another 24-hour shift. And on an ambulance with, with uh, having to don PPE every call, it, it's very taxing. So um, thankfully things are, are leveling off a bit. So, uh, but um, that's where we are. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Vecchio. Thank you, Chief Abbott. Thank you, Cynthia, for all you do. And thank you, Nick, for all you do in the Department of Public Works. Thank you. And thank you, Council President. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Councilman Krakowiak. Uh, I just really uh, wanted to sort of follow up on what Chief Abbott was saying, I think, about some of the illnesses in the department, because I my connection sort of dropped off there for several seconds, and I didn't hear what he said. But I also just wanted to ask both of you uh, sort of uh, a general question about the uh, incidences of infections, the virus infections in your department, have you been able to determine uh, the source of these infections? And for example, I know the police uh, have to gather quite uh, consistently in enclosed spaces. And of course, the fire, uh, the fire people, for the most part, are living in this, in the, uh, 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 the facilities. And so I just wondered, were, were some of the problems because of the closeness? And if that was the case, 
what happened and what did you do to sort of fix those issues? So in, in our instance in the police department, Councilman, uh, the one officer in patrol who tested positive, the contact, he lives in another municipality, the contact tracing occurred from that uh, We would have been notified if it was expected that we um, were the source of that spread and we were not. So we have no reason to think that our police membership was uh, you know, subjected to that uh, or, or subjected the ill officer to it. Um, I'm sorry you had dropped off. I was explaining that he was returning to do tomorrow. Um, I had spoken to him a few times throughout his illness, and um, he, he did sound pretty bad there for a while, but he sounded much, much better when I talked to him a couple of days ago. So uh, we're welcoming, welcoming, welcoming him back, excuse me. And uh, we have no, at that point, we'll have no officers outside with, with uh, COVID-related illnesses. That's great. Uh, with regard to the fire department, uh, we've had seven test positive, uh, but we've also had probably another four uh, who have had symptoms that were um, likely uh, COVID-19. Um, uh, they were told by their doctors that, um, that they, although they tested negative, uh, they could have been a false negative. The symptoms were, were pretty extreme. So... Uh, we treated it as we treated for them as if it were if, as if they were positives with regard to isolating other uh, people who had been in contact with them within 72 hours. Um, <clears throat> in terms of your question about how um, how the exposures were were caused, that's almost impossible to to know. Um, we have we have um, we we're, we're transporting patients every day. Um, and and there's it's 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 hard to know if, if if an exposure was was from a patient or if an exposure was from someone's wife who is currently working or from you know being in the firehouse or being in a rig with someone. Um, we've really not you know contact tracing is done obviously, but but um, we've we've taken it the approach we've taken is is if they present with symptoms, we assume that they have the virus. And, and we react that way. And our, our policy has been uh, anyone who has been exposed within uh, for a 10 minute, for longer than 10 minutes, uh, closer than six feet, um, that person, and usually that would be someone who shared a, a rig with someone, a um, little bit different, the police and the fire, police, the, the patrolmen are, are, and, and uh, patrol officers are, are in a car by themselves. Well, we work as teams, so, so they're all together. Uh, so, for example, if someone if someone tested positive or had symptoms, we'd have to put out the the, the other crew that they worked with as well. Um, <clears throat> as I said, we had a couple of weeks that were uh, tough for us because of that. But in terms of trying to determine where they were exposed, that's very difficult to do. So, okay, okay. great, great. I'm I'm, I'm uh, glad to hear. Uh, I, I also wanted to follow up. Uh, at the last council meeting, I had asked some questions uh, primarily having to do with uh, the long-term care facilities in town and uh, the, the, some of the people from the health department uh, <coughs> sort of declined because they, they were uh, thinking that it was a privacy or a HIPAA issue. And uh, since that time, uh, the state has acknowledged you know, a, a, a problem in this sector with the long-term cares. And uh, last week, the state began re posting reports of confirmed cases and deaths uh, in, the, in the nursing homes and facilities. And so I wanted to try to uh, determine if we could get, we meaning the council and I guess the, the, uh, the residents here, more detail about what's going on with uh, uh, the long-term care and the other senior facilities in town. Um, subsequent to the state putting these numbers up, uh, by individual institutions. Uh, some of the towns around us, Livingston, Cedar Grove, West Colville, are also putting up uh, long-term care statistics. And uh, Livingston in particular was reporting on the number of confirmed cases, the number of deaths, and the average age of the COVID deceased residents in long-term care. Is, is that something that uh, uh, you, uh, either of you have uh, tonight? Uh, well, as I, I, you had said, um, all the questions, Councilman, I, and I, I try to answer as best I could. Um, 
I, I don't. That's a that's that's managed through the health department. Um, so I I I had recommended that. Um, my first my first thing is I'm, I'm I'm not sure what what's not being released that you're saying needs to be released. As far as everything I've seen, um, that that the health department through OEM through the mayor has been there's been ages there's been a uh, number of 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 cases number of of recovered cases number of deaths um ages of those deaths um i, I unless i'm I, i'm i'm not sure what it is what else you're looking for oh okay. sure I, if it's I'm available looking... it's available it sounds like you there's a from from what you had sent you sent me a link it looks like the information is out there already am i am yes. I missing something it's 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 out there it's out there from the state and it's also out there say from livingston but it's not out from the from the town and and i don't i don't, I don't want to beat a dead horse but i'm looking for information about the senior facilities in town the long-term care facilities in town and uh either you have the numbers or you don't well i can i mean i can i can tell you from our perspective i can tell you um I don't know specific. I know that the 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 number of deaths in the long term term care facilities represent the majority of the deaths in the in West Orange. I mean, I don't know if that's a. I, I know that simply because I've been in. I'm on this 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 COVID task force, and and these this information is out. I don't know the names of anyone. I don't know family. You had mentioned about family members of people. I don't know family members. There's, that's not for, that's not for me to know. Um, I know personally the fire department, yes, we've, we've responded. I said that in, in my opening, um, that we've responded to close to 175 calls at the, what we consider long-term care facilities. I didn't include, because there's a, there's a difference between an assisted living long-term care facility and, you know, the Degnan house and the rent house. So I didn't include that. Um, but, but yes, we've responded uh, and that's information I, I mean, I can share. We've, we've been to, um, uh, to Summit Street 30 times in the, in the past 32 times uh, since March 1st. Um, and they're all, you know, their numbers higher than normal. Um, so I, I can't get into the specifics of, of what the calls were about, um, nor, quite frankly, do I know who from those facilities has passed from from COVID-19. Um, so we may have transported and then maybe a week later they passed. So I, I don't, I don't have that information. Um, and I, okay. and may, no, maybe, the, maybe the health department does. Um, but again, I'm not, you had mentioned in your, in your questions that, um, uh, that there were families that were, um, that were not getting information from the facilities, et cetera. And, I, I, I feel I feel for them. If we're if we're me, I, I would I would go to the facility. Quite frankly, I would call. I don't I don't know what what we can do at a private facility when a when a resident has a has an issue. I, I mean, if we could, I, I and I had said that the and this part I do know um, that that the facilities are governed by the state, not by the local health department. So. Um, so if, if there is an investigation of some sort, it comes from the state. It doesn't come from the West Orange Health Department or the West Orange Police Department or the West Orange Fire Department. Um, so I know it may be frustrating, but that, that's a question that would maybe have to go to the, the State Department of Health. Yeah, so, so that's fine. I, I just really wanted to know if you had the numbers. Um, when I referenced in my written questions that I had sent you, I guess, yesterday, uh, that uh, the families, I was actually asking about whether West Orange has identified any problems with that information flow that's required by state regulations uh, uh, based upon the fact that at the last council meeting, uh, Ms. Denova, who's the head of uh, the health department, said that, that the, uh, the nurses were in touch with each one of the facilities on a daily basis. So I thought that if there were problems that they would, they meaning the nurses would know about them. So that's why I referenced them. I certainly was not trying to find out individual names or anything like that. Again, I'm just trying to find and out. I, and I, and Councilman, I, 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 I think you're correct. They, they are because the, 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 an overwhelming number of cases are coming from the assisted livings. Unfortunately, that's, um, 
so so the 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 nurses and the other uh, public health professionals who are doing the contact tracing that's part of what they're doing so um so yeah they, they do speak to them but again i'm not as i said that mrs de novo would be the the person to ask um but i'm not sure she has maybe the specific information you're looking for either okay um, and I, I do want to I do want to say uh, thank you to the mayor because on a daily basis he is providing uh, some of this information. Uh, he provides it generally for the entire population. Oh, we're lo we're losing you, Councilman. And again, I'm just trying to see what's going on with the uh, in the long term cares. Uh, The West the Orange long-term cares have uh, two uh, in eight of the 11 long-term care facilities. Oh, am I having problems with my connection again? Yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not hearing you. Okay, I'm. I'm. Uh, I'm sorry about that. Can you Can you hear me better now? I can. I'm Councilman. Okay. Um, I don't know how much you missed uh, or how much I missed. Cynthia, your your cat is behind your head. <laughs> The beauty of these home uh, home sessions. Can you get your cat? They can't be. Uh, that can't be seen on the agenda. To sit on top of your head. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. Um, uh, did did uh, Chief uh, Abbott have anything to add to this conversation? Yeah, uh, again, I, I'll I'll just try to get through this as, as possible. The state has said that as of Oh, we're losing uh, it, you, Joe. <clears throat> okay. Um, if you can hear me, why don't you just move on to the other council people, yeah. and maybe sure. by the time you finish uh, with them, I can I'll have a better connection. Okay, Madam President. I'm sorry to interrupt, uh, Mr. Krakowiak. If you have um, yourself on Wi-Fi, if it's possible, if you can get a hardwired into your modem, that might help that uh, issue. Okay, then we'll yeah, move on. Yeah, I actually have the hardwire, the hardwire from. Okay. Uh, yeah, you may have to um, uh, end the meeting, end your meeting, and come back into the meeting <clears throat> using the link, and that might help uh, refresh your signal, which I think he might have just done. Okay. Okay, great, Lauren. If we can move on to Councilwoman Matu Brown. Yes. Uh, just uh, Matu, Ms. Matu Brown, just make sure you unmute yourself. <laughs> okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Um, first, uh, just want to express my heartfelt sympathy to oh. families who have lost. Oh, I'm sorry. That was my bad. Okay, there you go. It was for yeah. the question. I'm sorry. <laughs> Not yet. That's next. <laughs> Um, j just expressing my um, heartfelt condolences and sympathies for all those who have lost loved ones, friends, neighbors. Uh, it, it is devastating for us all to to experience this um, and experience this in spirit with you all. Um, to all of our community members who are stepping out um, in the face of all of this, Cynthia, um, Nick, and all of our other um, OEM volunteers, thank you so very much for what you're doing. I, I got a, um, a small confession to make, and as much as I am immunocompromised, I wish I could be out there with you, um, but I support as much as I can from the background, but just wanted to say thank you so very much for um, putting yourselves out on the line for, for our um, fellow neighbors and residents, thank you. Um, Chief Abbott, thank you so very much. I, I, I do have to say, I don't know if he's still on, I don't see him. Yes. I, I, I'm back on, I, uh, I lost, <laughs> uh, even the computer shut down. So. Uh, for for uh, your department, I have to say, I had an incident um, on Corwell Circle a couple of weeks back and the response was pretty amazing. It was someone that was from out of town and I'm sharing this just to bring attention, to raise uh, awareness to our um, residents when we ask people to stay home. Um, you're not just endangering yourself, but you're endangering our, our first responders who we love, appreciate, and most importantly need uh, more than anyone to stay healthy. This response um, 
ended in an arrest um, on, on our circle. And what struck me the most was the, the, the closest that our officers have to come in contact with whomever it is that they are approaching, whether it be a stop or an arrest. Um, and for the benefit of some residents, not residents, but whoever it is that they're speaking to approaching, it was necessary for that person to be able to understand the police officer, for the police officer to lower his mask. You know, and I think that that, that is incredibly important <clears throat> them, but it more so for the person to understand what the instructions were. Um, so I'm, I'm really going to just say thank you to all of our police officers for putting themselves out there and, and ask our residents to continue to stay home because you're endangering other people by going out needlessly. Um, I know they're long hours, but the response was, was immediate and, and it was um, handled professionally. But I was, I was so filled with anxiety watching um, the officer speak to someone who unfortunately he had to, couldn't understand him very well because of the mask. So please stay home and thank your officers for, for me personally. Will do. And um, Chief Vecchio, thank you so much. I, I, you, you're men too, uh, and your fire women as well, um, putting themselves on the line. I, I, I said yes, yesterday or the day before, um, we're close to St. Barnabas Hospital um, on Corwell Circle. And I, I just said yesterday to my husband, I am hearing a lot more ambulance, you know, sirens out here. Um, and that was a little unnerving. And that's for me just listening um, to those sirens go by. For all the calls that, that you have to respond to, I can't imagine what that stress level is like. Um, but a debt of gratitude for all that um, your department is doing, for all that you're doing for our residents. Um, Thank you. I have to say with respect to, um, and I was looking at um, uh, Councilman Kokorviak's um, links that he sent for Seed Grove, um, and the information that they're providing is very similar to what the county disseminates. Um, so I, I need a little bit more time to look into it, but I think that perhaps he, he's looking for information that is um, more specifically spelled out with uh, the um, senior citizen facilities. And that is something that perhaps the health department has. I don't know if that's something that you would have, but um, it is very much, um, the information that Cedar Grove puts out. It looks like, I don't want to say a copy and paste, but it's very similar to what the county um, information is disseminated from. So um, perhaps that, that might help a little, but um, just wanted to say thank you to all for doing what you're thank doing. Thank you. That's it for me, Council President. Th thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, Councilwoman uh, Courtney? Sorry. Are you muted? Uh, yeah, no, you, I unmute you. Hold one second. I got you. <laughs> now you can unmute yourself. We were playing a tag there. There you go. <laughs> thank you, Lauren. Uh, Michelle, I wanted to say thank you to you for this format. I know it does take longer than our typical conference agenda, but I subscribe to a planning publication called Smart Cities. And one of the things, the most important thing, is educating the public and keeping the public informed. And yes, the county sends out information every day. The mayor is posting information every day, thanks to all the information from the Office of Emergency Management. So thank you for providing this format to keep our residents informed. Uh, thank you to the chief for again, informing our residents on staying safe and the scams and those warnings um, to Chief Vecchio, I appreciated the fact that you actually had visuals of what people can donate because so many residents are asking how can they help, what can they do. Cynthia did the same thing. I had spoken to her during the week. I asked her about the pa food pantry and of course donations are greatly appreciated. But specific items. This week she happened to mention rice and pasta. But people need to know that because if they're shopping, they can buy a case of something and donate it. So I, I, I just appreciate the information that's being disseminated. And Nick, too, on recycling. Uh, I spoke to a recycler um, just this week, and they said with so many people staying home um, and working from home, they, they are seeing an uptick, uptick in the recycling tonnage by tons. So um, people recycling, staying at home, 
Uh, just really, it's a thank you to everyone um, out there. And I like the I like the plug from the chief and Nick about Millennium Strategies. They've been wonderful to work with. Uh, they actually bring things to our attention, uh, as you know, and it's the other way around too. We have ideas we share with them, but they bring information to us as well to work on. So that's a nice long list that they sent us. We asked for the annual report. There are plenty of things on there that we can work on. Um, thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, did you get, um, Lauren, do we have Councilman Krakowiak back? Yes, we do. Um, Councilman uh, Krakowiak, uh, if you can unmute yourself. I, nope, you can't? Okay. Nope. Okay, so um, Council President, I wanted to say what the comments that are being made about um, the house, the different senior homes and things. Okay. The health director, only because I am helping still with the CERT team and uh, doing an outstanding job with the Office of Emergency Management and the health department, the health department, the health director issues executive orders and they are going to all of the senior houses and the private facilities. So yes, they may be controlled by the state, but the health director is um, definitely involved and keeping them informed as well. Th thank you, Councilwoman. And um, did you did you have anything else? I don't want to cut you off. Um, nope, just really a thank you. Okay, th 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 thank you. Um, I'm not sure we're going to get Councilman Krakowiak back, but to um, Lauren, just let me know. Uh, but just real quick, I last night spent some time uh, with Susan Ivino and uh, Nick Allegrino on, on the phone. And the reason why I didn't ask them to come on this evening is because they're putting in, you know, 14, 15 hour days. And um, I wanted to also get some information from our chiefs, uh, which has been which has been great information and from and from Nick and Cynthia. So um, I I do I did have a conversation with Councilman Krakowiak today in regards to that chart that he's looking at that I saw what Cedar Grove is doing. So we'll investigate that and uh, see if that's possible. And, um, but I just, I, again, I, I just wanna thank all of you, the hours that have been put in, the time spent with residents and just how emotional it has been for all of you. I, at time to time heard it in your voices. It's not easy, especially for, for those of us who've known a lot of these people that are sick or have passed, um, who grew up here in town and, and knowing them for most of our lives, it's, it's, it's been hard. It's, it's been really, really hard. And just the uh, fear, fear from some of our residents. So uh, I'm, um, hopefully um, we're able to get a lot of uh, questions answered this evening and um, we thank you for that. So I'm gonna let- um, Madam President, your... I believe I have Councilman Krakowiak back. Okay, great. So Councilman, if you have another question and, and we'll wrap up, go right ahead. Um, can anybody hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, I according to my computer, um, I'm just on audio uh, and that seems to be fixing this, the the problem short term. We can uh, see you. I'm sorry, I need to. Uh, okay, I can't see. I can't see anybody or anything. Uh, so again, I apologize. Um, if if I could ask uh, Lauren to yes. do me a favor, sure. If you could, could you send me the link to uh, the Zoom session? Could you send it to a different email address? Uh, yeah. I'm gonna have, I'm gonna have to go to a computer with a hard wire. Okay, uh, there is a chat function on your computer. You can send that to me through the chat. Do you see it on the bottom there? Uh, no, because again, uh, or at least it doesn't appear that I have anything but a, uh, a minimized, uh, minimized, minimized version of the opening screen. Okay. It's, it's pretty easy. It's just joe at krakowiak.com. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, I'll send that right now. Okay, thank you. Sure. I don't know at what point I was uh, I was interrupted by my my lack of Wi-Fi, but 
I was saying that the state has been putting out information since last week about issues with the long-term care facilities. And they were saying that as of April 24th, there were 247 confirmed cases and 46 deaths in, uh, in, in the West Orange long-term care facilities, eight of the 11 uh, long-term care facilities. Three of them apparently don't have any infections. It, it's not reporting recoveries, which is one of the things I was, uh, I was looking for. Uh, but as I was saying, and I think some of the other council people had also said this, that the uh, nurses, and the OEM overall are in at least daily contact with uh, each one of the facilities. And I was just wondering if there was any information that can be provided tonight about uh, either recoveries or more general what the, what the trends seems to be in the long-term care facilities. Uh I, th I think uh, Chief, I think both chiefs are muted, Lauren. Oh, I am okay, muted. Uh, one of the issues we found was with the difference in numbers was that the state was counting healthcare workers employed at the long-term care facilities. So, you know, if you had 10 workers go out sick, that looked like there was 10 additional cases of elderly people, which was not the case. This information is reported by the state and by the county counties call their numbers from the state numbers. Um, and that's what we've been referring people to. We don't, we don't um, police per se, for lack of a better term, the long-term care facilities. They come under the state regulations. So other municipalities may be putting information out and I'm not suggesting they are, but that information may not be accurate. We would prefer to put out nothing but accurate information and refer people to the state when they are seeking that information. It was on the initial page uh, when the meeting first started, the website and the phone number for residents to call if they have concern with a particular long-term long -term facility in town. Um, we can't speak, and I know you're not looking for it, but I just want people to be mindful. We can't speak to um, somebody who calls us and says, my aunt is in uh, one of the long-term care facilities, and I want to know if you know her. she's positive or, or her roommate is. We can't even if we knew that information, we couldn't share it. So um, again, you know, we just want to refer everybody to the state, keep it simple, or get the right information. There's both a phone number and a website for them to contact. Right, I just did the math on this. If eight of the 11 long-term care facilities, if you break that down by the total numbers, it looks like there's about 30, 30 confirmed in each one of the eight long-term care facilities uh, confirmed with the virus and roughly five, uh, four or five deaths per facility, but then there are three that are reporting uh, no infections. And I'm just wondering, is, is there any insight uh, either of you can provide as to why that seems to be that uh, three, of the, three of the facilities are not showing any uh, confirmed infections at this point? Because that's obviously great news. And uh, if they're doing something that the others aren't, maybe that's something that can be shared with them. Uh, uh, yeah. It's probably tantamount to better lucky than good. Um, I, I think that, you know, from what I know in speaking with uh, both Susan Ivino and Miguel Greeno and uh, Teresa Tobe, it certainly seems like all of our long-term care facilities are very much on top of their game. Um, they're using PPA, they're doing everything that they need to do. Uh, the problem is they have a very susceptible age bracket there. So, you know, one, one virus can spread to multiple people. <coughs> Um, you know, again, if anybody has any questions, comments, or concerns, I would direct them to the and, and if you don't mind, if I like to add, I just from having family in various facilities and taking care of them, I know some, not all facilities, has a hospice, and and some some a good majority of these facilities do has hospice care, and I I know that has to be taken into consideration. So there's I think a lot of variable factors from questions I've been asking um, the past couple of weeks, you know, looking into the data and, and the whys, but I think that could play into it too. Not everybody uh, takes hospice patients, so that could be a, a factor. And the long-term care facilities 
speak to one another, much the same as Chief Vecchio indicated. He spoke to some of the other chiefs when he's talking about a schedule change. I talk to colleagues throughout the county and the state every day. Um, I'm very confident that these long-term care facilities are speaking to one another, borrowing PPE from one another when well. Um, they're all in communication with the uh, EOC and Nick Allegrino and Susan and Teresa. I, I'm very comfortable that everything is, that can be done is being done. Okay. All and right. I, guess, I guess there's no information about recoveries either in the long-term care facilities. I know the mayor talks about that in general and for the entire town, but any information about recoveries? I don't believe we have that information um, specific to long-term care facilities. Okay. Uh, just a couple more questions. Um, at the last council meeting, I thought I understood a member of the OEM team say that the state had in, been involved with uh, some of the facilities in town, and uh, but couldn't get any more information. Uh, is is there any information that you can give us about uh, what the state was doing, why it was doing it, and uh, what the impact had been, and what the status is? As it relates to what specifically, I'm not sure exactly what the what my, well, uh, the, the state the state sending people into some of the facilities here in town. Well, that's because the state oversees the long term care facilities, not the township. The, the local health departments do not oversee long term care facilities in any means. I understand that, but given the number of long term care facilities in the state, I suspect they don't go to every one. They only go to the ones that they have some particular interest in. And that's why I was trying to find out whether there was some particular interest, whether they had problems, or issues. Uh, None that we're aware of, and you know, I, I'm not saying your suspicions grounded in more than a hunch, but um, you know, we're not, we can't. I can't really respond to um, what you may may or may not suspect. You know, I, I, we're not aware of any problems unique to West Orange nursing homes, long-term care facilities. Okay. Uh, according to the mayor's uh, statistics, only about 25% of the confirmed cases and uh, just under half of the deceased uh, residents uh, with the virus in, in town have been in the senior facilities, uh, which means there's been a, a, a large number of uh, a large number of people who were affected uh, below the age of 65. Is there is there any insight you can provide us as to why uh, not only that's such a large proportion but also it seems to be uh, seems to be ongoing uh, in terms of flattening the curve. We've been in the lockdown for five or six weeks, but we still seem to be reporting uh, significant numbers of uh, deaths and, uh, uh, and new infections. Um, I spoke with uh, Susan and, and Nick both earlier, and my question I think goes to the heart of what you're asking, and our numbers are not out of line with the state numbers. So, you know, there's a bunch of uh, reasons that the, the curve, as it begins to flatten, will spike back up. So it's not, it's not anticipated that the curve will drop off the way it went up. It's going to come down much more, much more slowly, much more gradually, and it's going to spike up and down as it comes down. And if you looked at a, a graph line with West Orange, it should be pretty much in line with what the state graph line would be. Uh, just a couple other questions that I had uh, sent over. Do you have any data on the uh, the activities of the contact tracing in terms of how many how many uh, contact attempts, how many uh, successful contacts, uh, anything like that? I don't have that data with me. Um, I, I know that uh, the health center and uh, uh, you know, a shout out to the Board of Ed because the nurses have really stepped up to assist with this too, with the contact tracing. Everybody's really been very diligent working on it. Um, you know, if the, if the person uh, turns out they live in a different town, it'll get transferred to that town. So we wouldn't, we would lose that data. And sometimes you see the numbers adjusted for that. Um, you know, I, I don't know exactly how many people uh, were contacted and weren't contacted, but uh, I know, I know anybody who was in contact certainly wasn't for lack of effort. Uh, there's been some discussion about uh, some of the town employees who have been confirmed cases and, and what happened to them. Uh, is there any overall numbers either of you have that uh, indicate the number of, of uh, in town employees who have been confirmed cases who, or, or presumed 
how many of them uh, have uh, been hospitalized, whether any of them uh, uh, died, and uh, the number of recoveries just for the town employees. I'm not, I'm not aware of any uh, deaths of town employees related to COVID. Um, I don't recall specifically um, anybody being hospitalized. I don't want to say they weren't. If it, if it did happen, you know, it's a, it's a private matter for one. And if the employee lives out of town, it's not our investigation anyway. So we may not even have that information other than uh, through our insurance carrier if they're insured by us. And, and that would be highly confidential as well. Um, you know, the, the, the people I know that had it or were exposed are all uh, on the men doing better. We had uh, two exposures in the police department. Uh, one's returned and the other one returns tomorrow. Um, the, uh, we have one, I think, out uh, on home confinement for uh, exposure, but not testing positive. And the other one had returned. So, uh, you know, police-wise, we're in real good shape. Tony can speak probably better to the fire department. And uh, most of the town employees were having uh, work remotely unless they're absolutely necessary that they come into Township Hall or one of our other buildings. Uh, I mentioned before. Councilman, I, I can address the employees <coughs> overall. Uh, first, I can tell you, we absolutely have had no deaths. Uh, and to the extent that we've had any serious cases, uh, they've been far and few between. Um, but they, we, we did get statistics uh, from our, our um, CPA, our third party administrator, and uh, our incidence of, of uh, corona related illnesses is more lower than one tenth of the state rate. So our, as, and that includes all of our retirees as well as our employees. So as a group, as a group, we've done, we've been very, very healthy. Uh, and I, we can't, we, we don't have an answer. Your next question is why is that? And we don't know the answer to that. And we're probably not going to know the answer to that, at least not for a while. But we do know and we're thankful for that. Thank you, Mr. Gross. Okay, Councilman, do you have uh, any, any more? I... No, there, there seems to be uh, uh, a dearth of, of hard information available tonight. So I think now's a good time to uh, stop my questioning and perhaps uh, in the next couple of weeks, we can actually start getting this information. Okay, th thank you, Councilman. Um, again, to all our guests this evening, I can't thank you enough for coming on and taking the time to answer, answer uh, our questions as well as give some great information uh, to our public. Um, you're gonna, uh, Lauren's gonna uh, re relieve you from this call. And uh, we appreciate, again, your time. Please keep safe and well. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, for Thank Cynthia you. and for the chiefs, I'm gonna, uh, you're gonna become an attendee and at that time you're able to stay for the meeting or leave at your leisure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, could I just ask uh, Council President? Sure. If, if uh, uh, if uh, Chief Abbott and uh, Chief Vecchio could uh, stay on the, the call just in case there's somebody at public comment or people at public comment that would like to ask about uh, the virus. Uh, that, I'll, I'll leave that up to our chiefs. I'm not sure. I know we've had them for a while. I, I didn't ask them to stay longer than that. So I'll, I'll, I'll throw that out there to them. They could stay as an attendee. Uh, I, I know Chief Vecchio is still at the firehouse, so I'm not sure about him, but. Right. I do not have uh, Chief Abbott anymore. I do have uh, Chief Vecchio still in the attendee. And I think you have Chief Abbott. You don't have Chief Vecchio. Yeah, I'm here. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I actually then have uh, Chief uh, Vecchio is in the pool, so I can bring okay. him back over if you'd like. Okay. Um, if you'd like, you know. Uh, or okay, you'd... so we, we're going to move on to public, I'm sorry, not public comment. We have our redevelopment uh, update, Mr. Sayers. Let's make sure you unmute yourself. Hello, can you hear me now? Yeah, you yes, go. how are you? Good, how are you guys doing? Good. 
Okay, just so you know, there have been no changes in any rentals at the facility. I talked to Mr. Diaz today, and there's also been no changes with the sale of the property. Um, so everything is status quo as it was two weeks ago. Okay. What about uh, Central Avenue? Central Avenue? I'm not so sure where that's at. Richard, are you here? Rich? I am. I am. I'll be glad to. Uh, so, yeah. um, uh, again, Central Avenue, and in large part, again, because of uh, the construction official and Janice Gary Adams' zoning official, is totally up and running, as you will recall. It's 100 units. Um, it's uh, owned by Valley Residential, and they have begun occupying it. It's 55 affordable and 45 market. Uh, and the uh, affordable, there's a waiting list and they are filling it up. I think there are over 30 of the units are occupied. Um, again, it's not the perfect time yet, but they are starting to uh, market the other units online. Uh, and the people are moving in and these are families and this neighborhood is coming back. I also did we're, we're trying to get to you as soon as possible uh, a presentation on uh, what I'll call the uh, Biddleman property. As you know, we acquired that property uh, and Selective Flash. So that's the subject of an interim uh, redeveloper agreement along with Tompkins. And so I am hopeful uh, that they are finishing the uh, concept plans and whatnot. There'll be some shared parking on that that'll help the valley area and the luna theater and whatnot so again our boards are we're trying to do everything we can to move forward uh on on those fronts so again central avenue is up and running great thank you mr trank um any of my colleagues uh councilman guarino any questions no i'm just going you know i I've answered my question. I wasn't going to answer about retail because if everything's status quo, that means there's no movement on the retail. So uh, that'd be the only question I'd have with um, okay. Edison Loss. Thank you. Councilman Krakowiak? Uh, I was just going to ask if there's anything new on phase two of downtown redevelopment. No, there's nothing new right now. Obviously, they have to finish up some issues with the planning board. And since there's been no meetings, uh, they haven't been able to get it before the board. So. Nothing, nothing new has changed as of yet. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Councilwoman uh, Matu Brown. Hi, thank you. Just uh, a question, any movement with Essex uh, Green? I'm sorry, Executive Drive. I always do that, Executive Drive. <laughs> as of right now, no, we're still status quo with them also. What? I, I, well, as to Executive Drive, um, the, the uh, applicant they they have uh and i spoke to them earlier this week they are uh putting in their plans before the planning board uh, and they are going to ask for a special meeting um as soon as the planning board will give them that so uh they put in their application to uh, mr mccauley uh, to get approval for uh, i'll call it the, the residential component of executive drive Thank you. Thank you. Councilwoman, uh, you done, Councilwoman? Yes, I am. Thank you. Councilwoman uh, McCartney? Are you mu muted or? Thanks. I don't have any questions, but just to clarify on the planning board, our April meeting was a conference call, and on our agenda there was Montclair Golf Club. Uh, we are having a practice meeting for our May 6th. Uh, tomorrow evening, we're having a practice Zoom meeting for our May 6th planning board meeting. And our agenda there is one property on Whittlesea uh, that is being subdivided. So there is nothing before the planning board for um, anything with redevelopment uh, right now. Thank you, Councilwoman. You're welcome. Um, thank you, Mr. Sayers, for that update and our council liaison announcements. Councilman Garino. Thank you. Thank you, Council President. Um, just a quick update for our downtown West Orange. I have some depressing news that we will not have our street fair this year. Uh, the timing and the organization and getting it all together, we wouldn't have enough time and not knowing 
when we revert, revert, you know, revert to any kind of normalcy. Uh, at this point in time, uh, the board has decided that we will not be having a street fair this year. Uh, and I'm sorry to say that. It's a great, a great program, a great thing to bring people together downtown. Uh, but if I hear anything different to my colleagues and to the residents, I, I will let you know. Um, on the other thing is, is that, um, you know, we need to support all our vendors downtown, Pleasantdale, St. Cloud, and everything else. And it's good to see when our organizations go out and, and they buy product from um, for our vendors, but they need to make sure they go visit all our vendors because there are a number of vendors who have constantly given to every organization in the township of West Orange, schools, Boy Scouts, all, all our programs, different organizations, Mountaintop, how. And I'm hearing from some merchants that they feel they're not being you know, involved in any of the, of the goings around of, you know, helping out and, and product being bought for them. We need to help all our merchants. And it, 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 it really, when, when I got merchants calling me, asking them why nobody's come to them, I really don't have an answer. I just want to let everybody know is please, you know, patronize all our vendors. They need your help right now. And, and we need them more than ever before. So I just wanted to, to bring that out. Um, the other thing is on the joint meeting, Laura, I'd like to bring up that slide. <laughs> um, this is something I talked about the last meeting, but this is something very, very important. Um, as we you know, I represent the township on the joint meeting, which the joint meeting of Essex and Union County, we manage the sewer and waste management and um, purification of wastewater in, in our area, um, 15 municipalities that belong to the joint meeting. What we're having is now from our engineers and our environmental engineers and our consultants is we're seeing in a, a huge increase in a number of wipes, sanitary wipes, you know, being flushed down the toilets and they're starting to back up the sewer line. If you think COVID-19 is a problem, if the sewer system backs up and it starts backing up into your house and into the streets, you're gonna have more of a problem than anything else. So if they do say flushable, they're not flushable. Please dispose of them properly. Please do not put them in um, the, your toilets because it's gonna back up the system. And our engineers are telling us right now they're seeing an increase in the number of blockages. And I will update you at the next meeting and let you know how things are going. And um, one other thing is that, you know, we've all been talking about honoring people in our town, just specifically those are friends and family and neighbors who have passed away due to COVID-19. People have talked about ways of honoring and I think they're all great, but I just want to bring up a point that I put on Facebook the other day is that we are replanting trees in our neighborhoods and the trees we've gotten, they don't cost the township anything. And I've reached out to um, Len Lepore. I think I also sent an email to uh, Nick Solis that we could probably take some of the trees that we're planting, plant them in neighborhoods where we've lost friends and relatives and, and put a little plaque on them saying, you know, in memory of, and I think it'd be a fantastic way of honoring people and honoring them with something that'll be around for years and years to come. So um, that's all I have to say, Council President. Also, thank you to all our departments, to all our men and women in, in all the services throughout the township at West Orange for all the great things and making West Orange the township that it really is. And thank you, Council President. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman uh, Krakowiak. Uh, nothing for me. I'm still trying to get back on. Okay. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, Councilwoman Matu Brown. No, nothing for me, thank you. Uh, would you want to talk about the census for us? <laughs> There is the uh, slide. <laughs> I thought you were going to want to do that. <laughs> Thank you. I'm looking. I'm saying, wait, that's mine. How are you? Thank you again. Um, yes, I, I was really, really excited to see that um, West Orange self response. We are at 60.2% rate. Um, well, I just checked it a moment ago. So we've increased from that slide. Um, which is clearly above the yeah. national average, right? So we're at 60.2% response rate. The county average is 48.2. So we're doing a really good job, but I want to continue to challenge and encourage each one of you to reach out to your friends, your family, your neighbors, and send them a reminder of, of completing the census. 
now more than ever, we are uh, in, in a conversation yesterday, I understand that um, nationally, right, or nationally, statewide, locally, we are going to be facing an economic tsunami and we need as many of us to be counted in New Jersey, in West Orange, in our county, so that we can benefit from the federal dollars that are um, allotted to us by responding and representation. So please be sure to, if you have not done so, get, get onto the census website. You can either call in your response, enter your response online, or respond by mail. It is confidential, it is easy, and it is quick. So please be sure um, to complete your census and, and tell your friends to do the same. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Councilwoman McCartney. Thank you, Lauren. <laughs> I mentioned before about the planning board. The planning board will have its first Zoom meeting on May 6th. We're having a practice session tomorrow evening. Um, the Jerry, I like Jerry's idea of the planting the trees. We're doing that already on the streets. It's still a very nice idea. I had, um, as you know, I was sharing an email about Arbor Day. Every year, the Environmental Commission and DPW put together an Ar Arbor Day celebration. That This year, it was supposed to have been last Friday at Roosevelt Middle School. Since that didn't happen, we've kind of put our heads together to come up with a memorial garden, a site to be designated um, for all of our residents. Um, hopefully in the very near future, um, but there's there's no telling on that. So I was just glad that it was unanimous that everyone involved in that decision-making is on board with uh, creating something for uh, our residents. Um, the West Orange Environmental Commission again and the West Orange Arts Council to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Started, I started a photo campaign of things in nature and it was really a beautiful, take our minds off a little bit um, of uh, the circumstances. And we had really beautiful photos coming in, created slides that are posted on both the Environmental Commission page and the Arts Council page. It's not over, there are still photos coming in and we're going to continue to create the videos on that. Um, I had mentioned the uh, Office of Emergency Management and the Health Department again, fielding calls and um, for lunches and delivery services with um, all of for our seniors. So we through the CERT team. So members of the CERT team are out every day delivering lunches and uh, and dinners for residents. Um, very appreciative. And the Rena House, though we haven't had a board meeting, the Rena because. I'm delivering lunches to the Rena House, uh, keeping all of our board members abreast of um, information going on at the Rena House. Well, again, I just, I really wanted to say thank you again. I know people are looking for ways to donate. Uh, to Jerry's point to, uh, before about supporting local businesses, what's happening with CERT team. Um, it, uh, donations are coming in through the Mayor's Sunshine Fund. And that is helping to subsidize the lunches and the dinners that are being provided through the restaurants. And the limited resource, but I thought it was important to spread that amongst other restaurants. There we go, the Mayor's Sunshine Fund. So donations there are going to support the local businesses that are providing these uh, lunches and dinners. And that is coordinated through Laura Van Dyke and the Health Department. So, uh, Great. Thank, thank you, Councilwoman. You're welcome. Um, and to that, um, another avenue you could uh, donate um, through the Mayor Sunshine Fund is uh, Perry Bashkoff had organized a uh, a um, Mayor's uh, Sunshine Fund uh, sweat uh, shirt uh, T-shirt program. Uh, being distributed through the school uh, district. He uh, actually, it was a uh, coach grant that, uh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, coach grant had helped organize that and we appreciate all his support and Andrew Masarek, uh, our football coaches. So a great opportunity to not only support 
but also to have some township spirit, uh, which is uh, you could donate at www.woboe.org uh, backslash wo strong. So uh, again, just great community spirit. We're trying to help out our many uh, our many uh, businesses in the township, as uh, my council colleagues has stated. Um, this week would have been restaurant week, and that would have been a, a great way to help all our restaurants. And um, but again, to my my colleagues' points, if you go out and uh, they're still there, the, a lot of them, many of our restaurants are still um, delivering, uh, either delivering or they have curbside delivery. So uh, look them up and support. I know I get tired of cooking every night of the week. Well, actually, my husband helps out a lot. He's a really better cook than I am. Uh, but, you know, every once in a while, you need a break. Uh, so uh, we celebrated our anniversary the other night and uh, had a nice romantic evening with my uh, son, who stuck with us for the past six weeks and uh, helped uh, support one of our local eateries. So please reach out. I know times are tough for everybody, but our local businesses really do need your support. Um, let's see, Lauren, what's our next slide? Oh, okay. So as we are supporting all, I have to give a shout out uh, to Monica Nieves. She, Monica, had asked the mayor if she could uh, put this sign on the township, uh, on town hall. We are in this together and great, great community spirit. Uh, I drove by uh, Kelly Elementary School. There was a sign there as well. So really a big shout out to Monica. Uh, just seeing on Facebook all the in inspiration from so many of our residents. Um, it, it, it's just been, it, it's, it's taken that sadness and shifting it to seeing what we could do together. And we really are in this together. And in that spirit, uh, helping out the food pantry and, and um, with all our food deliveries, um, we needed masks for our volunteers. And I have to also give a shout out to uh, my fellow uh, congregates from Lady of the Lord's Church. I was on a, a call with Father Jim a while back and a few of my neighbors and, and members of the church uh, have been very busy passing time at home. And I, I have to ask, uh, thank Miss Ann Flug, Julie Coates, uh, Annette Charmante, Mairead Riley, and Lisa Westheimer for thank you, thank you, thank you. They've been busy. And I know there's been many residents out there uh, donate, donating masks and, um, and whatever they can donate to the various different organizations. But um, we've been giving them out at the food pantry to serve for all the uh, volunteers, the mask, and uh, been delivering them to, of uh, folks in the senior houses uh, that have been wanting them. And what, what a great job they're doing. And, and last, I just want to, um, again, thank all, all of our township employees, our OEM, and everyone that's been working so hard. And even our, our administrators that are on the, on the line tonight, Mr. Sarris and Mr. Gross, I, I know it's been a long haul these, these past couple months. Um, again, any of our seniors out there, reach out to Laura Van Dyke, Dorothy Sanders, uh, at uh, 973 325 4105. They will help you. They are there. They may not answer your call immediately, but they will get back to you. And they've been instrumental. And, and even as busy as they've been working with the residents, uh, they've also been writing a grant. We're going to talk about our grant writer tonight. Uh, they've been writing a grant for ARP um, for senior outdoor exercise equipment that we're looking to put up at Degnan Park. Just a nice piece there. Councilwoman McCartney was talking about the, the trees up there and planting. And, and I know Bill, Billy Keogh a month or so ago, we're talking about another grant we're hoping to get, uh, for the field. So we're just looking at some nice improvements up there, uh, at Degnan Park, which would be a nice place to, to do a memorial. So we're looking forward to all those good things. And just one last shout out to, I know Mr. Keogh's been working on, I mean, him and I have been having a few conversations, um, you know, with the recreation department, you know, one of their tasks is to bring the township together. And, you know, obviously that can't happen right now. So he's been working on some creative avenues to try to, uh, to keep our, bis our, uh, our residents active. I know the PAL has been doing online workouts with the, uh, with the PAL teams, the baseball teams, which has been great. And, so everybody has been really creative and, and thank you to Mr. Fagan too. 
He's been out there three nights a week with, with, his, uh, with his show, entertaining uh, many of our residents. So um, again, going back to the sign that's up here, we are in this together and it, it really shows we should really be proud of our community. And with that, uh, Madam Clerk, we close out conference agenda. Uh, we appreciate the, the public for being patient. And uh, Madam Clerk, if you could open up the public meeting. Sure, this is to inform the general public that this meeting is being held in compliance with section five of the Open Public Meetings Act, chapter 231, public law 1975. The annual notice was emailed to the Star Ledger and filed in the township clerk's office on October 31st, 2019 and published in the West Orange Chronicle on November 7th, 2019. Councilman Garino? Present. Councilman Krakowiak? Present. Councilwoman Matute Brown? Present. Councilwoman McCartney? Present. Council President Casalino? Present. Will everyone please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And, and to, to the, the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice, and justice for, all. for all. The council is now in their public meeting. <laughs> okay, we are now going to open up for public comment. We appreciate everyone for their patience. We hope you appreciated the information as you waited. And um, the, uh, our moderator, uh, Lauren Grocktizes, is going to signal you into public comment. Please note, you will have five minutes. You'll have the timer. Please state your name and your address for us uh, when you go to speak. And after the five minutes up, we will go on to the next person and then answer all public comment at the end of the session after the last person has spoken. Okay, our moderator. Okay, uh, Mr. Fagan, uh, follow the prompts on your screen, please. Uh, yes, uh, am I unmuted? Yes, you're all good. Uh, yes, uh, good evening, <clears throat> excuse me, good evening everyone, and uh, thank you, Madam Council President and uh, your esteemed council colleagues. I just want a, a few quick announcements. Uh, I don't want to repeat anything that's already been said, but residents can uh, stay informed by going to our Facebook page and to our website. And uh, certainly those that don't have uh, online access can go to TV 36, uh, channel 3645. Uh, to a lesser degree, a lot of the information is, uh, is posted up there so that uh, everyone should be able to, uh, to, to get some information in some regard. Um, I wanna point out uh, about the recreation department. Uh, up on our Facebook page, there was a, a notice there uh, today or yesterday posted by um, uh, Recreation Director Mr. Keogh, that most of the um, spring programs will likely be canceled uh, uh, because of the uh, home confinement situation. And uh, the pool, it's uh, yet to be undetermined if the pool is going to be open or not, uh, but all preparations are being made uh, so that if the all clear does come, that the pool will be ready uh, for the summer season so we can remain uh, hopeful in that regard. Um, one other thing I want to point out, and it's uh, uh, kind of obvious, but it's certainly worth men mentioning, is phone a friend uh, during this time. Uh, you know, create a routine, uh, reach out, phone a friend, uh, stay in touch. You know, uh, just the uh, sound of, of a familiar voice can be uh, certainly very uplifting uh, during these times, which can certainly be very dreary. And finally, uh, if this is helpful, I just want to uh, point out, um, Councilman Krakowiak had pointed out earlier, on our Facebook page, there are three pie charts that uh, list um, deaths by age, uh, uh, cases by location, and deaths by location that spe specifically refer to the long-term care facilities. That information was posted on, on April 22nd and is up on our Facebook page. Um, uh, I don't know that it has been updated uh, as of yet, uh, but it is anticipated that information will be updated. But certainly, uh, as uh, was pointed out earlier, Mayor Parisi is putting um, uh, uh, daily updates on the uh, West Orange Facebook page. So uh, that is it. Um, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to speak. And if anybody has any questions, as always, I'll be willing to answer them best I can.
Thank you, Mr. Fagan. Okay, do we have anyone else out there? Okay, yes, I do have um, Claire Silvestri. You will have um, a mute on your screen. If you can okay. follow that prompt, please. And can you hear us and can we hear you? I can hear you, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. Okay, uh, Claire Silvestri, 20 Grandview Avenue. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, testing for, for uh, town residents for COVID. Um, um, I appreciate all of the uh, information that Mayor Parisi has been posting daily. I've been keeping track of that, as well as uh, the state figures of, that are posted on their dashboard for long-term care facilities. And it's, you know, it's, it's been um, very concerning to see how many cases and deaths are, are coming out of our many nursing homes. At the same time, uh, it's only about, um, I'm surprised, it's only about 50% of, um, of the deaths. And um, I, you know, I think maybe a third of the cases. And so we, we have an issue, there's concerns of, we have issue just in the greater West Orange area outside of the long-term care facilities. And the governor is, has been saying that the way to, to flatten the curve is through testing. And um, in looking at the, um, the figures from the mayor's reports, it appears that we've only had about 1,700, maybe 1,800 uh, residents in town being tested. And that's, I think it's less than 4% of our population. So I was wondering if the township has any plans uh, to um, get more people, uh, a lot more ramping up testing, getting a lot more residents tested. Uh, I uh, had questions about whether first responders and nursing home residents are getting priority testing. I, from what I heard from the two chiefs, it doesn't sound as if all of the first responders have been tested. And I would just like uh, to, to hear whether um, the town has some plan coming up in the near future to get more residents tested. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Claire. Okay, Any, anyone else like to speak this evening? Okay, I have uh, Mr. Puglisi. Um, give me one moment here. Mr. You Puglisi. can follow the prompt on your screen, please. Thank you, you had a busy day and you made it, thank you. Yes, barely. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is Anthony Puglisi representing County Executive Joe DiVincenzo. Um, first, I want to just um, provide some remarks to Ms. Silvestri's comments before. Um, in our conversations with state health officers, they're actually discouraging municipalities from conducting their own health, uh, their own screening sites because of the lack of PPE. Um, so what I'm going to do is in leading off of that, uh, we've been conducting a testing site in Weequake Park since March 26th. Um, we've finally gotten through a 5,000 name waiting list, um, and we are going to reopen our website uh, that's open currently, uh, so people can again uh, log on to there. Uh, it's by appointment only. Also on our website, um, in the, uh, there's a, a bunch of links for coronavirus information. Uh, in the update section, the coronavirus update, there are um, Essex County testing sites. Uh, some of them you may have to go through your healthcare provider, uh, so there's different requirements for each. Uh, some of those sites specifically offer testing for first responders. Um, so there's an avenue if, if the township wants to get their first responders uh, tested. Also, I know on uh, specific dates at the state testing sites, they do open those up just for first responders. Um, Councilwoman McCartney had mentioned this um, earlier uh, and that the, the, one of the, the keys to getting everyone through this uh, pandemic is information. Um, just like the West Orange website, we're putting up a lot of information. Uh, it's been, it gets updated fairly regularly. Uh, so we just invite people to, to check back Every so often, our small business office is regularly uh, looking to find out what programs are available for small businesses. Uh, we've put up some social service um, 
resources uh, that, that would provide people with contacts in, in case they're involved in domestic violence or um, um, suicide, you know, things like that. Uh, we have to be uh, pretty cognizant that, that the situation that we're all in, uh, while some of these may not get reported, they, they're still in existence and they're still happening. Uh, and then finally, uh, my day today was filled um, at Branchbrook Park. Yeah. Uh, we had an emergency food giveaway. Uh, we provided uh, 2,000 residents from throughout the county uh, with a uh, box of food and some produce. Um, this was a partnership with the Community Food Bank of New Jersey. And the way this, the food was packaged, it was enough to provide 40 meals. Uh, that's four zero meals. Um, it was, uh, we, we did create a little bit of a traffic jam. I, I don't want to say that the event ran perfectly, uh, but we did get through it uh, pretty well. And we are looking to do um, other events in other por portions of the county. Um, that would depend on what resources that uh, food banks, the community food bank and other uh, food sources have. Uh, and I'm available for any questions. Thank you so much, Anthony. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, do, does the um, do any of my colleagues have a quick pre question for Mr. Piglis right now? Everyone okay. is muted. If in case you do, so make sure you unmute yourself. Council President, I, I just wanted to um, since Mr. Piglis mentioned that the um, state was discouraging municipalities. Um, from having their own testing sites. Um, is that something that um, if municipalities were to have a sufficient amount of PPEs either donated or somehow they, they were able to acquire some, is there a process that the municipalities have to go through? Is, it the, is this something that's state approved or? or um, well, um, the PPE is only one half of the test. You'd also have to get the testing kits from a, a lab. Okay. Um, and probably if you were, wanted to pursue that, your, uh, your municipal health officer would be the best resource for you. Um, if she has any questions, I'm sure that our, our, our health officer, Maya Lordo, would be available. Um, but as we all know, we're all, in, we're all competing for the same um, supply of PPE and test kits. So until something uh, comes out in more of a mass market as far as testing, um, in the past couple of weeks, there's been some uh, uh, movement and some, some news about some new tests that are coming that may be quicker and cheaper and faster and all that. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, that's the directive that we've heard from the state as far as towns um, starting their own testing site. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. A any anyone anyone else, I, uh, Mr. Puglis? Before I let him go, I have a question, Council President. Sure, Councilman. Thank you, um, Anthony. It's good to hear your voice, and I hope you and your family are well. And thank you for being with us tonight. Just a quick uh, question, not related to COVID, but on the issue of the uh, the tree pruning uh, in the reservation on the main roads. How is the status of that going? Uh, so the since um, April twentieth, which was last Monday. A uh, tree company representing JCPNL has been cutting or trimming trees along power lines on uh, Brookside Drive, which is in the Milburn section of South, uh, South Mountain Reservation. Um, I'm told that they should be finishing this week, weather permitting. Um, and we have some rain in the forecast for, I guess, Wednesday and Thursday. Um, so I, I, I'll probably get an update. I can let everyone know on Probably by Friday, I'll know if they're going to continue uh, for the following week. But it was it was a two week project. Okay. Thank you, thank you very much, Anthony. Thank you, Council President. Thank you, and, and Anthony, just to piggy on back on that, I wasn't going to mention it, but Councilman brought it up. Uh, I'm going to say an email tomorrow. Um, we from the public um, PSEG uh, on uh, by Walker Road. There's a and Northfield uh, resident sent me. Uh, there's a fire hydrant that's um, blocked from some of the remains of the of the tree cutting so I'll, I'll send that to you tomorrow okay all right I, I, okay thank thank you very much Anthony we appreciate you coming in this you're evening. welcome we know it was a long day and we really appreciate 
uh, the county support with uh, um, the county support with um, with feeding so many families. But, but, but oh, just real quick, I have one more thing. Uh, we've been talking about these long-term care facilities. I'm not sure how much of the meeting you've been following um, with the with some of the nursing homes in the county. Um, do they are they supposed to provide their own testing to all their uh, uh, residents? Do you know offhand with the county facilities? Um, I would have to check with our health officer. I, I don't know. I don't have the answer to that. Okay. If but you I can, can, just I let can us find know. that. Sure, I can let you know. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, batted out of order there, but um, we had Anthony here with some important information. We always appreciate all our updates from the county. They've been very informative uh, throughout this whole crisis. Um, our moderator, do Lauren, do we have anybody else out uh, in the public that would like to ask a question? Um, we did have someone who did raise their hand, but then they lowered it themselves. So I just want to give them the opportunity okay. in case they made a mistake of lowering it, uh, if they wanted to re-raise their hand. Okay. Nope. That was it then. Okay, great. So we're going to close out public uh, public comment. We uh, we appreciate all our speakers. Again, Mr. Fagan, you, you've been great on uh, on on Facebook uh, Live with your. Uh, with your program, and we always appreciate all, all you do for a township. Um, I know maybe, I'm not sure if, if Chief wants to answer some of Mrs. Krakowiak's questions in regards to um, um, regards to the testing or with the cases, if, if you have uh, any comment. Yeah, I'll answer in reverse order. The long-term care facilities are doing their own testing, so um, that takes care of that portion of oh, okay. Krakowiak's question. Um, the, the first part was more general testing, I believe, for residents. Um, right now, only symptomatics are being tested. And, uh, you know, as, as Anthony Pelosi really pointed out, we're all, we're all in competition for the same limited resources. So to get everyone tested at once, we're not really there yet. I'm not suggesting the, the governor's not on point, but we can't do that yet. We don't have the... It would overwhelm the labs, the tests aren't available, and what would really occur is people who are symptomatic and ill wouldn't have tests available for them to, to be monitored. So, um, you know, for right now, I think we have to take it one step at a time. The uh, Every morning I have a statewide conference call with the Attorney General's office and the New Jersey State Police. Um, Essex County's been fabulous. Uh, you know, my uh, compliments to uh, Sheriff Fontour and his staff, they've been great. Um, we've been sharing supplies throughout the county. We've been sharing information throughout the county. We've been in touch with, you, with each other constantly. So, uh, you know, I, I think we've, we're doing all we can do. We're always open to, you know, suggestion. But um, there's, a, there's a, lot of, uh, a lot of minds out there thinking on this every day, talking about it every day. And you have, uh, you know, if you, if you called up all the, uh, this, the uh, seniority there, I mean, you'd have hundreds and hundreds of years of, experience in the health field, law enforcement, uh, fire and EMS, I mean, it's, it's all there. So I think there's a lot of moving parts, but it's working very well. Um, you know, no, we've never seen as a country, we've never seen this before. And to, to think how well it's working is really speaks volumes to how talented everyone out there that's in these different fields is. Really, uh, you know, they've, they've always had my respect, but, uh, this just underscores how wonderful these people really are. Thank you, Chief. I, I know Chief Vecchio is still, still there. I don't know if he wanted to add any, any final comments. I think Chief, I think Chief Abbott, let me turn this down. I think Chief Abbott uh, covered everything uh, pretty well, so I, I don't want to be redundant. Uh, Thank you. But uh, I did want to say that if anybody has any questions, you know, our, our Phone numbers are all are all out there. So, um, uh, so is the health department. So we're we're answering our phones. Um, if anyone has questions about anything uh, offline, please give a call. I know Mrs. Denova feels the same way. If there's a concern, call the health department. Uh, Chief Abbott gave out the non-emergency number at the police department. Uh, we're all still working. So, so, so um, you know, the only stupid question is the one that's not answered or something like that. <laughs> One does <Thank> not ask. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, gentlemen. Really, really appreciate it.
Uh, my colleagues, I know we didn't have much public comment. Um, Councilman Carino, any other? I just want to go through quickly. Are you? Yep. Are you no, I have no, no, no responses. Thank you, Council President. Great. Uh, Councilman Krakowiak? Uh, thank you, Council President. I hope everybody can hear me and I apologize for my uh, connection problems. Uh, in the chat, in the chat for uh, this meeting, somebody has, appears to have uh, presented a question. Right, I can actually, sorry, this is Lauren, I'm gonna cut it right in. That was when I opened up the chat to you, that person did that and I'd respond to them that that was not for, um, like to communicate with the panelists and if they wanted to, they could speak during public comment and they did not raise their hand during that time. So okay. that's why we, we disable the chat feature so that we don't have uh, people like anonymously or posting chat to the panelists. Just wanted to put that out there. Okay, Th thank you. I, th it was a, a, a rather lengthy question, but the, but the punchline is, I want to understand why our cases are so high and what can be done in the future to possibly mitigate such an infection spread. Oh. <laughs> I think that's the, uh, Hundred million dollar question. Yeah, right. Any uh, I, I stay don't home know. and stay away from each other. Yeah, that's how you eliminate it. And wear your mask and gloves too. That's um, right. And, and just in terms of, of my response um, uh, to uh, Ms. Silvestri's uh, question, there have been some, I think, preliminary discussions about testing trying to open up some place to test for the antibodies, but I'm, I'm not really sure uh, where that stands now. And I'm, you know, I'll throw that out in case anybody knows anything about that. Uh, Chief, other chiefs, did, have you heard it's, anything? It, or? I know it's available in West Cobo right now. Um, the, the problem is it doesn't necessarily tell you anything other than you have the antibodies in your system because the jury's still out on whether or not you can get still out on whether or not. Um, that's right from the medical community. That's not my opinion. Um, there's just not enough data yet available to conclusively state that you've had this before, you have the antibodies in your system and you will not get it again. So it's not really gonna tell us a whole lot. When it's the medical and scientific community determines they want that, I'm sure they're going to encourage people to have uh, to be tested for the antibodies, it just can be done, as I understand, with a finger stick. It's not even a uh, vial of blood from your arm. Okay. Thank you, Chief. Okay. Councilman, you're good? Oh, sure. Okay. <laughs> All right, great. Councilwoman uh, Matu Brown. Um, no response. I just wanted to add to what Chief Vecchio said um with respect to if you have any questions please be sure to contact um the appropriate departments I, I will share that on two separate occasions i've been contacted um by a resident and i've directed um their um issues and needs to laura van dyke and within hours there was food and attention and the need was filled as busy as they are they are answering um you know um requests so please be sure to reach out to and if you don't know who to reach out to um you know just call the main number um and uh, either the fire department or the police department oem everyone is here to assist you um someone who reached out to me some was just um Someone just gave them my, my cell phone number, which is fine as well. My, my information is out there. So if you don't know who to contact, we're all available and we'll direct you to the, to the right um, resources. Please don't be afraid um, or, hated or shy or embarrassed to reach out. We all need help. That's it for me, Council President. Thank, thank you, Councilwoman. Councilwoman uh, McCartney? Thank you again for all the information. Thank you. And uh, again, thank you, uh, Chief Abbott and Chief Vecchio for hanging in there with us. Uh, next time conference agenda, um, I'm hoping uh, we're gonna have uh, the mayor here and I'd like to bring in Mr. Keogh and maybe I'm gonna uh, even ask Dr. Cascone, hopefully we'll have some kind of inkling of, um, from the governor of uh, you know, what kind of plan we may have moving forward and, 
and hopefully we could get some more information out to our residents on uh, you know what life will be like um, in the next couple months. So um, so thank you. Um, like to move forward now with our <coughs> consent agenda, Madam Clerk. Okay, approval of minutes of previous meeting, public meeting April 14th, 2020. Consent. consent. Report of township officers, none. Reading of petitions and communications and bids, none. Bills, are there any questions on the bills? Consent. consent. Resolutions, are any resolutions being pulled this evening? Okay, so I'm going to um, do what we did last time. Um, we'll stick on this page first. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure we're going to, well, I know I would like for uh, Mr. Gross and Mr. Trank uh, to, to uh, we'll pull C to talk about um, Rock Spring a little bit and what's going on there. And um, I like, you know, just have a short conversation. I'm not sure if it needs to be pulled. Does anybody need A to be pulled? Uh, Millennium Strategies? No, just conversation. Yes, please. I'd like it pulled. Okay. Any any other items on this first page? We, F is removed. Okay. And um, and there's only two items on the next page. Laura, yeah, great. If you could go there and then we'll go back. Um, G and H. Does anybody need either one of them pulled? I'm going to get ask Mr. Gross to give an explanation of does anyone need those two items pulled? Okay, great. So um let's go um let's start here because we're on the page mr gross can uh, you just give the public and uh quick over on these two resolutions uh 110 and 111 in regards to um the bonds yeah, these are pretty much housekeeping resolutions that are required whenever we go from a bond anticipation note to a long-term bond uh we you know the, the, the analogy I think that's fit is a bond anticipation note is like a, a home equity line of credit. So the, the, the interest rate moves on that over time. Whereas a bond is more like your mortgage. Once you set it, it's, the interest rates are set for the entire term, 10 to 12 years, whatever the, the term is of, of the bond. And so, uh, you know, we, we've been doing one new issue a year now for the past four or five years. And uh, this is right in line with what we're doing. The interest rates are historically low, uh, and we hope that will continue, although there's obviously some uncertainty. Uh, and obviously, if, if uh, we end up not getting a good rate, we'll pass it by and go with on anticipation notes. But in the meantime, we need the authorization to move forward. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Gross. And, and Lauren, if you just go back to the prior page. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> okay, we'll talk about C in a minute. Let's go to um, A, uh, Millennium. Uh, Mr. Uh, Gross, if you could just state, and there was an increase in the contract, if you could just uh, state why. Uh, yeah, this, we, we went out uh, and, got, and got quotes um, for this. That When they came back, they came back with uh, an increase that they're that they're requesting. Uh, we looked at their history, and frankly, we've been thrilled with them. And I, you know, I'm not the only one to say that tonight. Um, last last year, uh, in in competitive grants that they wrote, it was over six hundred thousand dollars that they wrote. So they're looking for an increase of six thousand six hundred dollars this year, uh, and the uh, administration supports that request. Okay. And and I'll speak to this real quick. Um, just having the opportunity to work with them on uh, on a couple of grants, one being the Partners with Health grant that we were able to secure and has been very beneficial to our senior uh, uh, citizen uh, resources. Uh, Dorothy Grant, um, who, uh, I'm sorry, Dorothy Sanders, who is our senior livabilities coordinator, uh, is paid for uh, through that grant and uh, with, talking to many residents and, and uh, being very thankful we were able to build back up our, our senior uh, department uh, to, to a full-fledged staff of the employees that we have uh, because of that grant. And I, I know grant writing is very time consuming and they're putting in a lot more hours. And uh, so I, I, I 
I know they're higher than last year, but again, the amount of hours and work and the return on the investment, I, I can't speak enough to. Also having uh, been able to be in meetings with uh, Chief Abbott and the school district, um, they secured a $300,000 uh, cop grant uh, for the school district this year. So, you know, that was instr instrumental that uh, the school district was able to uh, take advantage of the relationship. And I know they, you know, helped out Mr. Uh, QB as well. Um, I'll go down the line here. Uh, Councilman Garino, any comments on this? Yes, thank you, Council President. I can not only speak for myself, but also for my pedestrian safety advisory board. Because of Millennium, we've been able to generate a lot of grants, particularly for our walkability studies, our implementation of walkability, particularly in on the Main Street, the Washington School, Edison School area. Uh, we just received, because of Millennium's guidance and work, uh, a $10,000 grant for walkability um, in, you know, um, um, assistance and uh, engineering for the walkability. Um, so we're very pleased they come to our meetings uh, very uh, uh, accessible um, anytime. They actually come to us and let us know when grants are, are available and, and apply for them. So I, I have nothing and you could reach out to any one of my board members on the West Orange Pedestrian Safety Advisory Board and they will say the same thing. Uh, they, they've educated us, they, they've helped us understand what we can do and what we can't do, but, and also which grants are, are reachable. So uh, that's all I want to say. And um, I appreciate the work they've done for us. Thank you, Council President. Th thank you, Councilman Krakowiak. Uh, yes, thank you, Council President. Uh, there is actually a choice uh, in two different proposals that uh, were made uh, that we're talking about tonight. There's uh, Millennium, and there's also Bruno Associates. And both of these firms are major firms. They're some of the biggest firms in this part of New Jersey, and they both have a ton of municipal clients and have been doing this for years and years. So uh, relatively speaking, they're both pretty comparable from a marketplace perspective. Uh, back uh, a few years ago, I'm trying to think what year that was. Was it 2015, 2016? These two also squared off for the grant writing contract. And at the time, uh, Millennium was about uh, $3,000 more a year. Uh, and uh, the council majority uh, chose Millennium and they seem to have done uh, a very good job since then. But also since then, uh, Millennium has raised their prices about 40% whereas Bruno has kept them stable. And now uh, the gap between these two has opened up uh, by about 58%. Bruno is still at 25,000. Millennial is now being proposed at nearly $40,000. And I just wanted to point that out to everybody because I think this is going to be a very, very challenging budget year. And I think we should be looking uh, everywhere we can, we can save money. In this case, we would uh, we'd be saving uh, almost fifteen thousand dollars, and almost certainly getting a very good uh, a very good grant writing firm. So uh, that's why I wanted this poll because I encourage my my uh, colleagues, even though you know Millennium has done a good job, that it might be uh, a budget year to prioritize uh, saving money uh, and choosing Bruno. Thank you, Councilman. Councilwoman uh, Matu Brown. Um, I, I didn't want this pulled. I, I appreciate the conversation. I, I did too have a concern with respect to, and while I understand and appreciate everyone's working relationship with Millennium, um, and all of the grants that are listed that they have successfully um, acquired, which are pretty extensive at 622000 over $622,000, um, looking at um, the difference in what's been bid and um, the similarities in the um, organizations. Um, you know, the additional $15,000 that Millennia is charging is, is a little concerning to me. That's okay. it. Thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, Councilwoman McCartney. 
Uh, I appreciate the concern. Um, you know, I'm deeply involved with Millennium here on these grants. I happen to live with the chairperson of the Open Space Commission, and just today he put up the finishing touches on an ANJAC grant that uh, they have been working on. Um, we have uh, we have been awarded, as you can see from the first two pages, we have been awarded, as John said, almost $700,000. I'm looking on page four. There are quite a few more pending uh, grants that were noticed and uh, are coming due in June and July that we need to designate um, projects for. I know I had sent out an email to that effect uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, I am ready, willing, and able to work on these. Millennium has all of that information. Uh, some of these are transportation grants, and I know that we have submitted hundreds of thousands of dollars in transportation grants, as Jerry has mentioned. Um, they have our maps, they have all of the information uh, that we, uh, and they have our concerns. I'm not ready to move to a, um, look at a different uh, contract. Um, I, I just feel that I've been very satisfied with the work that they have done and the product that they have produced. Thank you, Councilwoman. And, and those are all great points and all great conversation. That's why we take our time to discuss things, these items. Um, um, this is one of those situations where the service, you know, pays for itself if it's done correctly. Uh, I'm comfortable because I've done a lot of grant writing. I also uh, was very involved when I was on the school board side. The amount of time they put in and it, it's increased. So um, from the beginning of the relationship, I'm not surprised because the hours, there's more and more hours and more and more operators on their end uh, that have been um, involved in, in the grants because they're, they never just turn us away too. So, uh, and they also, as one of my colleagues stated earlier, when, when they have something, they also get our attention. Um, in this COVID crisis, I, I've seen the level of service um, rise. They, again, working with our senior service department when they literally have no time and taken on uh, many of the responsibilities that the township should be doing um, in regards to getting them information and writing on our end, because we're supposed to be responsible. So um, that responsibility has increased over for them. So I think that's why you're seeing this increase. Well, I know that's why you're seeing this increase. Uh, volume has increased, which is, is more time. And uh, the production side of it, uh, as far as the writing itself, is, uh, is more labor intensive on, on their end. That has increased as well. Um, so I'll, I'll be looking forward to, um, you know, to approving this this evening. So council, Councilman, you still wanna keep this pulled and not put it in consent? Yes, please. Okay, great, great. Um, and then we have um, C. So, um, Mr. Gross and Mr. Trank. Mr. Gross, if you want to start off first, you know, we have this uh, great asset of ours uh, that we purchased last spring, uh, Rock Spring uh, Golf Course, and we have Governor. Uh, uh, not letting us operate it, uh, obviously, for the apparent reason. So if you could talk a little bit about the situation that we have at hand. Uh, as I think everyone's aware, uh, last year when we acquired the golf, uh, the golf course, uh, we hired uh, Kemper Sports to manage the golf course for us. Um, obviously, that management was, con was contingent upon them, us allowing them to play golf on the course, which the governor has usurped our authority on that, um, or, and rightfully so, it's just his prerogative to do that, but he has. So we were looking for uh, to a, a, a solution, um, because one of the main problems we have is if the course goes unmaintained for any period of time, uh, and we would actually lose the course. The course is, is maintained, uh, by a professional uh, who, who is licensed uh, to do such work on golf courses to maintain, because it's quite a science. Uh, it's, not, it's not something that's, that's easy to do. So uh, 
I, Mr. Trank had the initial conversation, so I'll let him talk, talk about the, the terms and conditions of, of, of the agreement that uh, you have before you. Uh, and then I can talk to you again about, I uh, guess, what our opportunities for mitigation of these costs might be in the future. Okay. Richard? Mr. Mr. Trank, Trank. Uh, you need to unmute yourself. Okay, I'm sorry, my fault. Um, so um, thank you, Mr. Gross. Thank you, Council President. Uh, one, you know, in Mr. Gross and I have been uh, working on this about 10 days uh, because uh, the we all understand the issues. So one of the things that we required that they provide us with was a detailed budget. And the, what's presented to you tonight is a maximum. It is all, it's all, it's all aimed at the minute that the course is able to open within 48 hours that Kemper will reopen it on whatever social distancing and whatever parameters is permitted uh, by the, the state. So uh, as, as you're aware from last year and as clearly exists, April and May are the critical months uh, with regard to fertilizer and as, as Mr. Gross and as we've been educated, the science of this. Um, so Basically, you have what's the bare bones to maintain the course in the conditions so that it'll be able to open within 48 hours. We are not gonna pay one nickel in advance. It'll all be a reimbursement with paid uh, receipts and backup. Uh, and obviously, uh, Mr. Gross will uh, talk to our hope in terms of recouping some of these dollars, uh, but um, we've come to the conclusion that we, we literally um, need to maintain this asset, that um, we've had all kinds of discussions with Kemper. Uh, they were not able to get a PPP loan uh, under the Payment Protection Program. They do not have business interruption uh, insurance that covers this. Uh, this does not cover any profit at all to Kemper. Um, and and uh, again, um, so I'll answer any questions or, or, or Mr. Gross can talk to how we hope this recoups, but 200 is the absolute maximum. If all of these expenses go out till June 30th, which obviously we hope they will not, keep in mind there's hourly employees. So when it rains, they're not able to be out there. So it will come in less than this number. And we've obviously had a lot of rain uh, in April. So, um, so th those we've talked to uh, various people on these issues. <coughs> Okay, um, Mr. Mr. Gross, you had, uh, did you say, mentioned already it sent us uh, staff reimbursement activities during the closure? Yeah, I, I, I want to I wanna assure that, uh, and piggyback on what Richard said, I mean, this is a reimbursement grant, and so whatever we're being asked to, uh, to reimburse has to be consistent with the contract and with the actual responsibilities that we want them to, to perform. Specifically, the, there's a list in there that, that we've provided you, which will be attached to the agreement, uh, which outlines the activities for which we would be doing, basically be doing the reimbursement. Things above and beyond that would not be doing what they occur. Um, and if they, if they tried to bill us for that. Um, you know, that, that, that's a pre pretty um, thorough list, I think. Uh, we went through by person by person just to get a sense, as well as the qualifications of the of their their um, um, course uh, director. I, I forget the exact title they have for it. But in superintendent. Course, there is Super, a, superintendent. Superintendent. The superintendent. So um, we're we're satisfied that, that that's the, the work that's required to be done, um, and that in order to to protect our asset. I think it's a key that key to, to talk about this. We want to make sure that, that the, the money that we've invested in this and the success that we've seen in this course, that we're in a position uh, moving forward to to continue that on once we're allowed to open up and get back full force. Um, as far as the funds are concerned, uh, at this point in time, we've, we've not received direction yet from FEMA as to what will be compensable and what won't be compensable. Um, they basically have to rewrite because, nope, we've not seen, you know, I'm going to state the obvious, 
Um, no one's ever seen this before, and we've never had emergencies of this nature before. So what they're willing to what they're willing to compensate for and what they're not, we don't know as far as FEMA is concerned. I did sit in on a uh, a, 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 a meeting today uh, with the um, organization of city, cities, uh, National Institute of Cities, and um, in there they were talking about the next tranche of aid that's being put together in the in the uh, at this in the Senate and the House at this point in time. Uh, obviously, I, you probably have heard one of the big fights is whether what extent, if if at all, they're going to support. Uh, state, counties, and municipalities, and but the, the package that they're looking at, the ones that are, that are on the floor now to be introduced, include uh, monies to, to cities, counties, and municipalities specifically for lost revenue, which is what this is. This is a lost revenue um, uh, situation. So it is somewhat encouraging that, that at this point in time, as drafted, there would be an opportunity for us to apply for those funds. So uh, I do think that ultimately this this event as an emergency, for the most part, is going to be a revenue loss of uh, emergency. You know, our, our incremental cost is not it's not like a a a, a, a snowstorm or an ice storm or 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 a hurricane. Uh, where we, we spend a lot of money on, in, in mitigation, uh, that type of mitigation, it's going to be lost revenues, and that's what everybody's basically seeing. So I, I'm, I am um, optimistic that that will be the focus of FEMA as well, and certainly if it's the focus of any other legislation that comes out of federal government, it's a positive as well. Having said that, there are no guarantees. And, and, and in the contract, you have language, which I read, um, that if there's any compensation um, that they were to get back, they would have to compensate us. If they got, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, if any of my colleagues have questions, Councilman Garino? No. Thank you, Council President. Sure. Councilman Kokroviak? Yes, thank you. Uh, could I, we get some sort of estimate? Your best guess on when the uh, the governor may allow these types of facilities to reopen? Pennsylvania opened up today or yesterday. Um, there's mixed reports about whether New York is open or not. It's ha it's starting to happen around us. Um, the, the bad the bad news is that we're not you know, we're, we're not as far along as as New York is in terms of the curve. So I would suspect, and I think the sense we got from his, his comments is he's looking to normalize things, start, start to normalize things um, by Memorial Day, which, which puts it sometime, you know, maybe mid-May, um, end, end of May maybe, but it's all again. There, there's, you know, you, you just don't know. Yeah, I don't follow his daily uh, news conferences, but I just wondered if he had said anything having to do with outdoors, parks, you know, the recreation. He, he talked very general today. He did not give any specifics. But the pressure's on. I mean, like I say, the, the, the states around us are, 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 are starting to, to, to allow it. Um, so I, I think that, you know, once, once we get over the curve, once we flatten out, Part on the downside is probably when that's going to be considered. But again, we just don't. Okay. Uh, I had asked you what the administration's estimate of the chances of getting a reimbursement and uh, the timeline for that. And I just want to maybe clarify this. You said uh, 75 to 100 percent from FEMA. Did you mean that's the total amount that you expect to be able to recoup, or do you think? That's just the chances that FEMA will give us at least a dollar. That that's the criteria. That's the criteria that FEMA, if FEMA pays, they will pay at least seventy-five percent. And there has been a request for them to pay, and there have been times when they paid as much as a hundred. So that's just their formulaically. That's their history. But I think what I just said previously pretty much answers your question in terms of 
what to, I mean, what, what the possibilities are. And timing is, you know, it was just last year, the year, yeah, last year, I think, the beginning of last year or the end of the previous year, when we got our last tranche of money for standing. So you, the money will come when the money comes. It's not usually uh, quick. Right. That's what I that's what I wanted to ask you about because I know we had expected to get a lot more reimbursement than the last I recall we weren't getting from FEMA for Sandy, but I didn't even realize we got money last year. Can you talk a little bit about what our experience was with Sandy and FEMA reimbursement? We actually we actually got pretty much everything. The only thing we didn't get was the uh um some of the recycling money that we didn't pay. That it was on behalf of, of, of another entity. Um, ultimately, we ended up getting pretty much everything we applied for. Okay. At seventy-five percent. At seventy-five percent. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, it, I mean, it I, took I, a long time. And you're right. For, for a long time there, we thought we weren't going to get very much at all, but we ended up. We were persistent, and uh, we 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 ended up, you know, getting what we were supposed to get. Um, and then, okay, thank you. And then you also said that uh, uh, may be available from the federal feds over the last, next 60 to 90 days. I, m one of my major concerns on this reimbursement issue is that every state, county, municipality in the country is going to be asking for this money. And we've we've already, I don't even know how much money, if you include the, the, uh, the financing plans, maybe we've committed five, maybe four or five trillion dollars to this. So I'm not sure how much more money is out there. Um, does that give you any pause? I've been, I've been in pause for about six weeks. So, uh, you know, everything gives me pause these days. Uh, but, you know, I can only tell you what we know historically. And, and, and look, we all know one thing. This is, as, as we say in the, in the front of the, the building, we're all in this, and that means everybody. And everybody's got, got the same problem. And, 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 you know, we have to have faith and, and persistence in dealing with uh, those that are going to make a decision to, to keep them focused on the, the, the real issue here. And the real issue for everybody is lack of revenue. So, yeah, do I have pause? I have agenda. I've got every emotion you can think about this, but um, we, 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 we have the things that we have to do, and we have asked that to protect. And if we don't do this, you know, in, 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 if, if we go on in, in the next two months and we don't take care of this property and make sure that it is properly maintained, we're going we're gonna to have a, 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 a golf, we're not going to have a golf course anymore. Or it's going to cost us millions of dollars to fix it. So it, it really is to me. This is the, the best worst case scenario. Okay, you had uh, you had also said that um, the the maximum of two hundred thousand dollars is projected to cover up to the next three months of April, May, and June. April, May, and June. Right. Um, that's obviously uh, a big cut from what was budgeted in terms of the expenses uh, over that time period. I mean, it's just much lower. Uh, but I wanted to get some idea of what is it that uh, is in the budget, the original budget, that's not going to be spent now uh, while there's the, uh, the lockdown. Just some of the major items because- it, well, I, you have 13 to 15 people. So you're talking four versus you, know, you got you got nine uh, nine to eleven twelve people that more that would normally be on that course working they're not going to be working that's your big nut right there you know it's it's bodies okay and uh, are there are there any layoffs then I, you know, are there any layoffs of the people that are working there now yes they um, they yes they furloughed they. Everyone except these four individuals has been um, furloughed. You know, basically, as you can appreciate, when they get into the busier season, they hire up, but they have definitely cut the staff to the bare minimum because Mr. Gross 
made it very clear we're not paying anything but essential to maintain the course. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't know how many of them were furloughed. Frankly, they were just gearing up when this hit, so they may not have yet hired everybody as well. So that, that's a part, or didn't, didn't have them come back. They probably have, you know, they have people that they hire for the summer and they probably didn't bring them back until, you know, hitting into it. So, so I just, I just want to be clear. Have there been furloughs or is it, is it more so the budget is going to be accommodated uh, by not hiring people? Again, I, we can find out the answer to that, but I believe that on a typical, we'll call it April or May, if, if this, if we weren't in the middle of COVID-19, clearly they have more than four people who work there on a daily, weekly basis. So I don't know. I'm sure Mr. Groves is right that they were staffing up. Because of course, the natural question I asked Councilman was, if you get the green light hypothetically on May uh, 15th, how are you gonna be ready to open on May 17th? They said, there's enough uh, college students and other people and, and people who've worked with in the past that they know if they call them, they'll come back in a hurry or they will get people from their other, they, they'll have the people, that's theirs. But I, I can't tell you exactly whether they had, they certainly didn't have the, the 30 to 40 people they have in peak season, but I do believe they had more than four people there uh, before March 21st when they had to shut down. Yeah, I think that's true. If you look at the actuals versus budget for this year, we've been, uh, the facility had generated uh, quite a bit of income in the first part of the year. Yeah, but I was just wondering if they provided provided a list. Um, one of the things. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I, 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 I respect how you're looking at it. Obviously, uh, Mr. Gross is always uh, trying to minimize the potential expense. So he looked at it from the opposite, saying, "What is the essential minimum we need to, you know, maintain the course?" Yeah, and you, you knowing me, know that that's what I'm looking at as well. Um, well, excuse me, Councilman, I, I just want to add to that, if you don't mind. You know, sure. don't forget also, the, um, they also had events booked that yep. they, they had to cancel and furlough people, you know, with their wait staff. So, you know, going into our second year with them, they had, you know, you know numerous events already planned already that obviously, you know, can't, especially April, May, they had like showers, graduation parties. And, and, and all that, so they had a, they definitely had a furlough, furlough people. Mr. Gross will have to get the answer for you, but um, there, there was definitely other staff, you know, that were going to be working on site. Go ahead. Right. Uh, one of my, one of my other major concerns is that, is that the way that the town and uh, the vendor uh, split the revenues in terms of compensation. I just wanted to make sure that it was clear what uh, what Kemper is and is not going to be compensated for during this period going forward under this this revision. And I saw an email, I think it was an email from somebody from Kemper who said that, that Kemper was not going to, sh to uh, take any of the management fee that it would otherwise do if there were revenues, because that's what the fee is, is based on. Uh, but it wasn't clear to me if that provision was in any sort of legal agreement so that they are legally obligated not to take the management fee. And, and I believe also not to take uh, this, uh, I don't know what you call it, the loan payback or the, the, uh, the, the fronting of expenses at the beginning of the, uh, at the beginning of the golf course uh, from this money. If there's no revenues, there's no fee. I mean, it's strict, you know, because they we, first off, we're the, we, we get the, we get a cut off the top. So we're getting nothing because there's no revenue. They don't get any revenue on the back end unless there's a prop. So they're not getting anything. So this is, this is the only money that's going to be going into this course un, until it reopens. Right. So, so just to clarify for my, my clarification, there's no management fee being used for this money obviously not for the town and certainly not for Kemper. And then there's also this, uh, this loan repayment that they also have a, a priority to. And I just want to make sure that that's also not going to be used for these funds. Correct. That's correct. Not, there is not, 
there's, there's, the money that this money is going to be used for is in the detailed sheets that that you have. You know, everything from fertilizer to chemicals um, to gas to wetting agents to irrigation to sand to you know for employees pest control security. It is the essential aspects needed to maintain the course. Okay. Do you feel like that needs to be uh, explicitly written in the agreement? It, uh, no, oh, because you guys just not pay it. No, but uh, you don't, it's a reimbursement and paragraph one says that we're funding operating expenses as set forth on exhibit A up to an aggregate amount. Um, and it says that they have to, we'll provide the funding. They give us a request every two weeks with appropriate documentation to document the operating expenses along with appropriate receipts, invoices, and other documentation. So there is nothing they could submit. It's hard enough to get a reimbursement for Mr. Gross for anything. There's nothing they could submit that's outside the four Thank corners you. of this. You're welcome. Um, that's why that's why you're there. Um, that will ever be considered. Okay. Um, I also wondered if you guys have done any sort of uh, what ifs on what happens at the end of three months if we're if we're not able to reopen? It's an excellent question. And um, the, the short answer is no. <laughs> because well, it, it, I, I would say we've contemplated it, but we don't have any conclusions. At this point. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a major issue. Uh, if God forbid the course, you have two issues there, really. One is, God forbid we're still where we are now and you can't open the course on June 3rd. The other point is the more likely one. The more likely one, uh, and this is why we need to work with them and, and be monitoring it. The more likelihood is they're gonna open and open obviously with social distancing and therefore the revenue and use is gonna be different than you even saw at the beginning of this year. This course has been tremendously successful and it's not gonna be able to have the same capacity that it had even earlier this year. So I think we need to take it in steps. Obviously, when they get open, the funding stops on our end. And obviously, for the near future, it's gonna be a different operation so that people can stay safe and healthy. And, and you know, let's get through this and then we're gonna to have to sit back. And just one more question. They're, um, they've, they've got four people listed in the papers. Uh, that they want to employ going forward. They they appear to be uh, some of the highest paid uh, employees that they uh, would have. Is is that satisfactory to you? Do you think they could Again, get this job done with with uh, at a lower labor cost? So so excellent question, but Ms. Gross was all over that from Jump Street. Obviously, council president, that was her first call on Thursday and Councilwoman Matute Brown has spent a bunch of time along on the phone with uh, our uh, contract compliance, uh, Mr. Kronheim, and I know Councilwoman McCartney also reached out to me. So net-net, uh, Mr. Uh, Ramage, who is the golf course superintendent, is licensed by the DEP. Uh, he, and, and I, I even spoke to Mr. Al Greeno because I consider him to be incredibly knowledgeable on all this stuff. He said, you know, we can't, you, we can't pick up the phone and just start calling people because you put the wrong, it's a science. And as was explained to Mr. Gross and I in more conference calls than I want to remember, was you put the wrong amount of chemicals on this course, too much, too little, it burns out. Um, so Mr. Ramage is a critical uh, person and he is the golf course superintendent and he's made the course uh, like it is now. Mr. Parker has been here since Jump Street he is the manager of the facility. He does much more than just supervise. He gets on the mower. They're, they're, they're all working at cross purposes to make sure this work is done. So uh, while Mr. Parker and Mr. Ramage uh, are obviously as the supervisors and the scientists, um, the higher paid and they're essential to the supervision and management, not just of the course, but again, keep in mind, they're maintaining the buildings. You know, we had problems from uh, some flooding issues in the beginning, some alarm issues to secure this property. Uh, the other two people are just the hourly people who, who run the mower, mowers on an hourly basis. So um, 
we don't believe there's any other way, especially in an emergency situation, that we could go out and get someone with the knowledge, the hands-on experience of Mr. Parker and Mr. Ramage to, you know, fill in those spots. Obviously, if we're sitting here on June 29th and the course isn't opening, obviously we're going to have to revisit all of this. But right now, uh, <clears throat> this is where we're at. Excuse me, Councilman. I, I just want to add to that, and, and Mr. Trank, I, I, just a slight correction. Uh, Mr. Parker feels like he's been here since Jump Street, but actually he, he came on um, actually a month or two after we uh, had bought, right. purchased the course, and there was a right. lot of issues in the beginning with the management, and they uh, took him from another location down in North Carolina, and Mm -hmm. uh, he has been a game changer uh, since he came and uh, took over that course. So he, he's he's instrumental in the in the operations there. There was the mention of Mr. Kronheim, who's a uh, the, I, I believe he's the town's consultant on the course. Is he going to be continued to be paid from these funds? I believe he is definitely one of the line items because he visits the course regularly and uh, his rate is part of is paid by the vendor so it's part of this amount uh, i believe it's it's a, it's a thousand dollars a month give or take it's a, a limited amount um yeah. thank you you're welcome That's thank all, you council president okay thank you uh councilwoman two brown am i unmuted yes i am unmuted thank you um I, as Mr. Trank pointed out, uh, mentioned that um, both Council President Casalino and myself have spent quite some time um, going through this. And I, do, I think it's fair to say that um, all of my council colleagues have had the same reaction, um, shared the same reaction that I have shared initially. Um, be very incredibly reluctant um, in this time to um, look at this and initially what stood out to me was two hundred thousand um, dollars for Kemper which is really not for Kemper but for um, an asset of ours. Um, Councilman Kukorviak asked uh, all of the questions that I had um, listed you know, with respect to contingency plans and the salaries that are being paid um, you know uh, the number of employees that are there why does general management have to be there with respect to chris parker and brandon and um shortly after several conversations that that i had um and then i spoke to actual um to our compliance officer who explained um what their um responsibilities are if you will. So Chris Parker, as general manager, obviously oversees the grounds of the club and all of the, um, you know, vendor relations <laughs> and, and things that have to happen while the golf course is, in essence, still on lockdown, but in in preparedness, preparedness mode for when the um, governor decides to lift the, the quarantine. Um, including in all that is getting on a lawn mower, cleaning um, fairways, aeration of greens. This, um, the example of the activities that the four employees that are being um, kept on, um, they're, they're all very hands-on and it is an extensive piece of property to maintain for four people. How they're going to manage that um, is, it's, I'm sure it's going to be quite time consuming and um, a tremendous job for them to have to do. I too had the same concerns as to um, what it is that we're paying for. Um, Mr. Gross did point out when he and I had the conversation that the resolution specifically calls out for reimbursables of every two weeks they are to provide um, um, invoices to document what um, maintenance expenses that they've had to pay and that's all he was going to reimburse for. Um, looking at that and then we all asked for the financials as well that we, we that, that were shared with us and um, looking at the 2019 results um, of, of what 
Kemper was able to do opening late as they did, um, looking at their net income for the first three months of operation is really minimal. Starting off, I mean, ending off the year strong and then starting off this year with now one month and possibly almost two because April is already lost. Um, and if May, if May is not ready to be operable, then that's a second month loss. And then what are you left with? Um, June, possibly July. I, I am not happy about this at all, considering that we're all in situations and some of us are there already. Some of us, uh, of us may unfortunately have to be there at some time. And, you know, our first response is, is who's gonna help us, right? But I also understand that this is a revenue generator for our town. This is our property. Um, and I, I think, not I think, I believe it is a responsibility that we have to maintain it in operable, ready operable condition so that when, when the governor lifts this quarantine that we'll be ready to go. And I, I made several phone calls to, you know, different um, legislatures to kind of get a feel as to, you know, to Council Corviac's point, you know, is there an estimate of when the governor will be? Um, I do follow the governor's um, uh, updates daily, and I did hear him say yesterday with respect to the May Memorial Day date, uh, uh, um, a newspaper reporter asked him whether or not we would be open by then, and he sounded optimistic. Um, obviously, it's not a guarantee, but I'm sure um, to other partners um, in, in um, neighboring states and following some lead in that regard. I don't feel that because we are in this situation today, we will be in this situation, you know, hopefully not for the next three months, but I do feel that because it is only reimbursable for every two weeks of documented expenses, um, that, that we have a responsibility to, to maintain um, property. And again, I, I don't want, I don't want the narrative to be, you know, oh, they're giving um, Kemper $200,000. That's not it. it. It is a reimbursement of expenses to maintain a property that the township owns. Um, and, I, and I think that after having all of the conversations that I've had and, and looking at what's happening nationally, um, it, when the governor lifts this, there's not going to be very many other places to go but a golf course for all those golfers who are looking to um, get out of the house. So while this is a hard pill to swallow, and, and it was a very difficult decision to come to, um, I, I think it'd be negligent if we didn't um, take care of the asset that we imagine. That's it. Thank you, Councilwoman. Councilwoman McCartney. Well, thank you, Council President. I came to the same conclusion as my colleague. Uh, seeing the total aggregate amount of $200,000, we're very reluctant at first, um, asking the same questions that we've all asked. Um, I appreciate Mr. Gross talking about the appropriate documentation that will be needed to account for all their operating expenses. Um, I also appreciated seeing the financial statements um, so that we know what it is that we are uh, paying for coming out of this um, maximum amount. I am very reluctant, but I do understand that we do have to protect our asset and um, we know how popular it is as soon as it, as it is open, as was stated before. Uh, I don't think we'll have anything of a slow start that we had last year at, around this time uh, because it is it has become so popular. And it looks right now absolutely beautiful. So they have been maintaining it and that needs to uh, continue. Thank you, Councilwoman. And um, yeah, I don't want to duplicate a lot of my colleagues' remarks. Um, being married to an avid golfer, I, I know uh, he's ready to call the governor, <laughs> telling, the, <laughs> telling, 
the protest opening uh, for play. Uh, golf as uh, all the sports, they, they made it, you know, it, it, it's, it's safe for social distancing. It, it is by nature. Um, you don't have to drive with your friends to the golf course. You can meet, meet your friend there. You could walk with a cart. And I know they fixed it with the flags that um, you don't, you know, the, the ball doesn't even go in the hole, so you don't have to lift it, lift it out of the cup. So they have already um, made adjustments to the game. It will slow down play um, a little bit, they, they predict, um, but it, it, it is doable and it will be extremely busy, especially with so many people still, still not maybe working from home. So, um, Hopefully we'll be optimistic. I, I don't see the course going later than, than Memorial Day. I'm hoping the governor considers for May 15th because um, it, it, it is one of those um, recreational activities that, that can be played with the social distancing. But I, I appreciate all the time that Mr. Gross and Mr. Trank has spent on this. Um, this was tough. Um, you know, my colleagues are being kind. I think we all kind of freaked out when we called them. So, because <laughs> this, this is a lot, um, this is a lot, but again, it is an asset and um, that we are responsible for, and we do need a quick opening. So as soon as the uh, word is given, uh, we need, we do need to uh, get this open within 48 hours. And this gives us that, uh, that option to do that. So thank you. Uh, for all your hard work and negotiations. I kind of uh, went out of order a little bit. Um, I'm gonna ask uh, Madam Clerk to go ahead. Um, we have two items pulled, um, A and C. We had a discussion. I didn't have a vote yet. Council so President. I think we'll just work backwards. And um, Madam Clerk, if you wanna call the vote for item uh, C that we're talking council, about now. Council we'll President. Yeah, yes, Council, no, Councilman. I'm sorry, I just I just came up with a, with another question on this issue and I think it's major or otherwise I wouldn't talk about it. Sure. But I, I just wanted to ask uh, the administration, uh, is, is this sort of contingency contemplated in the uh the contract that we have with them in terms of uh is there i, can't, I don't remember this that there's a whether there's a provision that says if the course is shut down we'll give you additional funds what what would be the what would be the responsibility of the vendor uh if we did not give them this two hundred thousand dollars again um i'll, I'll take that one because obviously yeah, we have question. obviously uh we have examined that issue and, and the, the bottom line is to go back to what has been said a number of times tonight by the two chiefs and whatnot and by Mr. Gross, this is unprecedented. Having said that, clearly the very nature of the agreement was that they would operate the course for us. We own the course, we own the building. And for instance, like with regard to the building, we have very specific provisions that if the roof goes or any capital system, it's the, the township's responsibility because in all honesty, as you know, we gave them a two-year operating agreement with three one-year options after that. So the bottom line is in the analysis that we did of the agreement was, and, and this is the uh, hypothetical that I used uh, with the council president uh, as, as uh, she asked the questions, if you rent me your shore house, and the governor says, I can't come to your shore house. You're not entitled to the money. And uh, you're not, there's a failure of consideration. And again, these are unprecedented issues. Uh, we can spend all the time we want to try to go make court ha hearings and precedents. But at the end of the day, um, the analysis is simple. We entered into an agreement with Kemper after we did an RFP process, and that was for them to operate the course. Uh, they are not able to operate the course, period. There's not even a gray area here. That would violate the law for Kemper or for West Orange to operate this course. So therefore, basically, we are mothballing our asset. And the key to do when you mothball anything is to make sure, as I think uh, several of the council people have said, um, that it's ready to come out of mothballs as quickly as humanly possible. So that is the analysis of the law department that, there would be no ability for us to force Kemper to, you know, absorb these expenses and stay there without any 
ability to do what they contract to do, and that is to operate a court. I have a, I have a question, Mr. Trank, uh, Council President. I have a question yes. for the law department. Uh, Mr. Trank, under a contract, and basically we've asked them to run our golf course, do they have any recourse under adverse actions or force majeure? Well, force majeure is obviously, you're right, the, the Latin term that is exactly what I'm articulating, that because of an act of God or because they're not able, the parties aren't able to effectuate the purpose of the contract, they could walk away. But of course, if they walk away, we'd be right where we are today. And that would be, how do we maintain this course? And then what do we do, knock on wood, as soon as possible uh, when we can take it out of mothballs? Uh, so, so the short answer is, you're right, Councilman Carino. It is, in essence, a force majeure. But a force majeure, and you're, that term is usually used as a pause. And that's where we're at. The problem is, this is like having a horse. You got to feed it every day or, or the horse dies. And that's why it's not enough to say to uh, Kemper, go home uh, right. to Chicago or wherever and come back whenever the governor says you can come back because there won't be anything to come back to. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, by Thank the way, you. I did get an answer. Mr. Parker, to his credit, is obviously listening as, uh, I guess, Zoom <laughs> meetings. Uh, and he did text me that, a total of 19 seasonal employees who were active on the payroll uh, before they had to close were furloughed. So that does answer the question that, yeah. and, and does get to your point, we brought it down to the bare minimum. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Trank. Thank you, Thank Council you. President. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, item, so, Madam Clerk, would it, would, I'll let you uh, conduct me. Okay. What, what would you like to do first? I'm going to ask for a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, the consent agenda is implemented. We have resolution 10420, resolution authorizing the township to enter into an agreement with Millennium Strategies for grant writing services for 2020 in the amount of $3,300 per month commencing on May 1st, 2020. Is there a motion to approve 104-20? So no moved. Motion. Second. Councilman Garino? Yes. Councilman Krakowiak? No. Councilwoman Matute Brown? No. Councilwoman McCartney? Yes. Council President Casalino? Yes. Okay, and resolution 106 20, resolution authorizing the township to enter into a First Amendment to qualified management and maintenance contract with Kemper Sports Management Inc., whereby up to $200,000 shall be provided to reimburse. Kemper for maintaining Rock Spring during the emergency cessation of operations. Is there a motion to approve 106-20? So moved. Second. Okay. Councilman Garino? Yes. Councilman Krakowiak? Yes. Councilwoman Matute Brown? Yes. Councilwoman McCartney? Yes. Council President Casalino? Yes. Okay. Now Thank we you. have Ordinances on second and final reading, 2602-20, an ordinance amending and supplementing chapter seven, traffic subsection 7-32.1, handicap parking on streets and subsection 7-32.2, restricted parking zones of the revised general ordinances of the Township of West Orange. Is there a motion to introduce on second and final reading? So moved. Second. Okay. Councilman, wait, I have to do the roll call. I Council know, Reno? Yes. Councilman Krakowiak? Yes. Councilwoman Matute Brown? Yes. Councilwoman McCartney? Yes. Council President Casalino? Yes. Okay, at this point in time, if there's any members of the public that would like to speak on Ordinance 2602 20, please let the moderator know. I'm going to give it just a couple of seconds because there is uh, sometimes a little bit of lag with the attendees. Okay, sure. You, you give me the signal. No problem. If anyone using a phone, they can use the star nine feature as well. 
And we have none. Okay. Um, open up to my colleagues. Any discussion on this ordinance? Handicapped parking on streets, uh, restricted parking zones. No, Lenny was on our call last time yeah. and we had asked him questions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Okay, Madam Clerk. Is there a motion to approve 2602-20? So moved. So second. Councilman Garino? Yes. Councilman Krakowiak? Yes. Councilwoman Batute Brown? Yes. Councilwoman McCartney? Yes. Council President Casalino? Yes. Okay, ordinance 2603-20 and ordinance amending chapter 25, sections 3.2 and 26.13 of the revised general ordinances of the Township of West Orange, zone map and conservation district. Is there a motion to introduce on second and final reading? So moved. Second. second. Councilman Garino? Yes. Councilman Krakowiak? Yes. Councilwoman Matut Brown? Yes. Councilwoman McCartney? Yes. Council President Casalino? Yes. At this point in time, is there any member of the public who would like to speak on, 20, on Ordinance 2603 20? Please let the moderator know. Okay. I have no one raising their hand. Okay, thank you. Uh, my colleagues, any discussion? We had uh, had discussion last time about this ordinance. You wanted me to recap? I have a, a split screen I can recap that what we're doing is taking a few lots out of a conservation overlay district that are zoned R2, which are large lots. We're changing that to an R5 zone, which would be more uh, compliant with the uh, area and that would make it easier uh, for residents in that area to uh, modify their home if they wanted to in some way. There are still quite a few lots. If you look at the end of the ord <coughs> ordinance in Schedule 1, there are still lots that would remain in the conservation district, potential public parks and public recreation areas, and, and they're listed. Thank you, Councilwoman. Madam Clerk? If I could there... just ask a couple of questions. Oh, sure. I, uh, I didn't, uh, I'm not really clear on this. Is the, the conservation district as an overlay, it's over privately owned property now? Yes. Some, and some are township. Okay. Do you know what the split is? I, I know this is in the master plan uh, update, but I don't know a whole lot about this. Uh, do you know no, why? Jerry, I was just happy to be able to split my screen so that I can read them both. Since we don't have all the printed documents, I don't have my master plan in front of me. And I, I don't know that that would be listed as, I guess it would be on the open space um, map on no, what is township no, this owned. Is, this is not open space land. This is not open, I didn't mean open space. I meant on the Rossi of undeveloped. And, and Councilman, what, what happened here was there's it's not only private pop, there's a built home in 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 the in that uh, re, in that section and and that is that is um, an error that shouldn't have happened when the overlay was presented. A built home never should have been put in that that uh, area. Okay, because it's like I think it's eight different lots, if I recall correctly. There are one, two, three, four, four five, five, six, six seven, eight, eight, nine, ten. ten. So obviously somewhere along the line, we thought that it was important to put all these properties in a conservation district, obviously to, to protect the environment. What I'm trying to find out is what, what has changed about this? I mean, do we still need to be protecting through a conservation district overlay? We still are on um, 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, 18, 21 other lots. We still are in that area. Yep. Yeah. Um, one of the residents had asked me a question about the um, acreage. So we're pulling out about two and a half acres, and there's well over 20 acres 
um, of lots left that are that are still in the zone that are still in the zone okay here here would be my question if i didn't realize that there was a, uh, a home that's already built on one of these properties so i can understand if you have a house that's there and they want to do something to add on to the house or expand it or whatever i can understand maybe you know one or two of the lots but i don't understand why we're we're uh basically basically selling off 10 of the lots why why that there's 10. well we're not selling anything um some properties are most of the properties are we own so we don't have to sell anything but there's some pieces that there's property adjacent property i was on the phone with mr greigel this morning asking him uh this there's one lot that has um that's owned that they want to buy um, a piece of a lot to make their property bigger and then there's another the house has wants to buy one of our lots to expand their existing home but not build on the new lot but to bring it out to the uh to the property line so okay. there's room there that potentially if we want to sell any other of our lots that the town owns there could be um spot housing in regards to like a home here or a home there if the township wants to to sell that okay but and then other lots are in the um steep slope uh or steep slope they're not even buildable so some of these lots aren't even buildable no but they fall in the block rent the street okay I, I i obviously don't know enough about this uh this ordinance so let's just move on i'm i'm uh, i apologize for not doing my research that's okay yeah. does any any of my other colleagues have a question or a comment in regards to this the planning board did also approve this and make a recommendation to the council Okay, uh, Madam Clerk. Is there a motion to approve 2603-20? So moved. Second. Councilman Garino? Yes. Councilman Krakowiak? I'm going to abstain. Councilwoman Matute Brown? Yes. Councilwoman McCartney? Yes. Council President Casalino? Yes. Okay, there are no ordinances on first reading, pending matters, new matters, council discussion. So I just quickly want to ask Mr. Gross, um, probably, probably the answer is going to be you don't have the information, but again, just um, in regards to budget planning, I know you tapped onto it uh, earlier, but it doesn't sound like there's any, any uh, kind of planning we could do right now, correct? Well, I mean, the, the next move is, you know, obviously is to schedule the budget hearing based on what was submitted. Having said that, I think that's kind of pointless till we see what happens with... Um, well, with excuse me, Mr. Gross, can you speak up a little bit? I'm having trouble hearing you. I'm, I'm not sorry. sure if anybody else is. I, I, I think it'd be pointless to, to move forward with a budget hearing at this point in time um, before we see what happens over the next six weeks. Um, you know, uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, to the extent this is going to be a financial crisis for this, it's going to be a revenue crisis. So uh, the, the governor, uh, we, we took the resolution off tonight, uh, amending the the, uh, the rate for delinquent taxes because the governor pushed back the due date a month, which we're thankful for that because there there were a lot of complications with 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 changing the the interest rate, which we don't now we don't need to go into tonight. Uh, hopefully in a month we won't have to go into it then either, but we'll see. Um, uh, but you know we'll, we'll know better how you know if people are paying their taxes and 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 where we are uh, on revenue. I just say this: to the extent that we're going to have a revenue problem, it's going to be in the third quarter, not necessarily this quarter. So we may do well right now, but we're going to we're going to have to be careful looking forward into the to the August payments. Because that's where people are not going to have the money if they're not going to have it. So um, we, we've got a, we've got a rocky three or four months ahead of us. Yeah. 
Council President. Yes. I could just ask since Mr. Cruz is here and he mentioned the executive order that was um, signed today by our governor with respect to pushing back um, the deadline for the taxes. Can you just discuss um, in brief terms what the municipality's responsibility to that is? Is it optional for municipalities? I know I've heard um, different discussions surrounding that. Um, so just to clarify for our residents and those who are watching, what in essence does that represent, signify? And um, that's the first question. And then freezing taxes, what does that, what, what kind of impact, if you can just briefly discuss, what kind of impact does that have for our municipality? Okay. Um, in terms of, of the, the, the governor's order today, this, the governor did something that we could not do. Yes. We, were not, we were not allowed to push back the date. Uh, four months. So we contemplated, and it was on your on your agenda this evening. For Excuse me, Mr. Gross. I, I'm sorry. I, I'm having trouble hearing you again. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, I, it was, we had a resolution off your consideration tonight, something that the council could could have done, which was reduce the interest rate from 8 and 18 percent down to whatever we were contemplating at or near zero. Um, so, so right now, you know, there's really nothing for the municipality to do because the governor has extended the date uh, for, for that, the, that the second quarter is due until June 1st, payable by June 10th. Um, so before before that occurs, we may or may not have another conversation about this. But at this point in time, there's really nothing else that we can do um, that will impact anything over the next month. Um, and getting to your, your issue of freezing taxes, um, Taxes are, you know, rev it's revenues and expenses. If whatever we do to, to you know, uh, deal with the, the, the expenses that we have and the revenues that we have will directly impact taxes. So, you know, I'm, you know, off the top of my head, if we, if we were to freeze at this point in time at last year's uh, tax rate, um, you're looking at layoffs and furloughs and all things that come with it. And I'm not saying that because I'm trying to talk you out of it. That's just a fact of the matter. And that's, that's obviously something that we're going to be and are kicking around as to what, what this all means to us. We just don't know the answer. If we don't know the, we don't know how bad it's going to be. I mean, it could get so bad that there would be very little we could do. And, and, and I think, you know, we're, we're, we, we, we want to make sure that we don't get into that situation and that that's where we talking to our legislators about aid and things of that nature to ensure that it never gets that bad. But just to, just to give you some perspective, if we, we collect around $230 million in tax revenue for all, for all the taxing agencies, um, and about three quarters of that comes from mortgage companies. So you're basically talking about um, 160 170, 170, 170 million of that 240, 170 to 180 million of that 240 coming from mortgage company, mortgage and, and bank. That means the rest of it's coming from tax base. So if you're talking maybe $60 million on a year, so on a quarter, that's 15 million. If people can't afford to pay their taxes, that's, that's an $8 million deficit just right there. And, you know, Eight million dollars is ten percent of your budget. It's you know it's 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 twenty five percent of your staff. So it's the potential here is could be devastating. Okay. I, I appreciate um, the response. I know that I've had some, um, and, and I've inquired about that too, but uh, as of late, I, I have had some residents reach out and, and ask. Um, what that what that uh, would be if we could um, I just want that um, you to clarify that thank you thank you councilwoman does uh, anyone else have any questions or another pending matter for the administration this evening yes please I'd like to follow up with mr. gross mr. gross given all the uncertainty uh, do you think it would be prudent to the uh, the golf course funding aside to try to cut back on expenses at this point? We have. 
And are we doing? What, what, have, yeah. what have we done? Yeah. yeah. That's great news. What, what have we done to, to, to reduce uh, expenditures? Well, the, the biggest thing is, is our operation is so trim that, that, we own, that, that normal everyday expenditures, a lot of them we don't have, have not had to do um, because we do, we're just not, we're not performing all the services that we normally provide. So it's not millions of dollars, but it is, it is, it is important that we do that. Um, in terms of staffing, we're certainly not putting on new staff. Uh, we're, we're minimizing, you know, our, our, our overtime, we, our overtime is way down in, in the police department because of the staffing shifts that we've made. Same thing with DPW. So we've made those changes as well. Um, so we, we've, we've, we've taken some actions already that save significant amounts, significant amounts of money. Um, we've, we're also learning more about how to do things. You know, the way we, way we're doing things that we may learn something from moving forward. Uh, about future ways to save money. Having said that, excuse you know, me, Mr. Gross. I'm sorry, we're having trouble hearing I you probably. again. Uh, I'll just keep. I'll just keep leaning in. Yeah, yeah. You gotta. <laughs> that's what I. That's what I do with my computer. As I, you can see my big face in here. Yeah. I've been leaning in. Go ahead. Sorry. No, it's just uh, we're we're you know, there's a lot to uh, a lot to to look at over the next six weeks, uh, and. Uh, we're, we're, we're dealing with it every day and looking wherever we can to, to mitigate costs and mitigate the potential losses. So. Mr. Gross, thank you. Can you uh, ballpark what a monthly uh, run rate is on the, the expenditure reductions going forward? No, I, I can't at this point. I, I, you know, I, you know, we're, 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 we're working with, 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 with not the same resources as if we were in the office. I don't necessarily have the ability to do that right now, but it's certainly something that will, certainly over the next six weeks, by the time we have a, a serious conversation about uh, where we can go, that will all be done. Okay. Um, I know last year when uh, we were talking about an eight and a half percent municipal property tax rate, you said that uh, uh, felt pretty confident you could uh, do this year's budget with a 2% increase. Do you still feel that way? Oh, I think we can do this year's budget with a 2% increase. I don't think that's going to be the issue, except for the, to, the, to the extent that if we have reductions in revenues, all bets are off. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I have a quick question for you. Um, obviously, we're not having the street fair. I'm sure Fourth of July has to be questionable at this at this point. Sure. Um, opening of the pool. So, as, as sad as it is not to have all those events, the cost savings have has to, I guess, help you in this situation. It's certainly helpful. I mean, you know, you're you're, you're talking. You know, a couple hundred thousand dollars probably, and that's you know, uh, that's what we spent tonight. But but you know, that, that's not to see that. Um, but that's not the, the question. The, the question also remains: is how big of a problem? Are we going to have a two hundred thousand dollar problem? Are we going to have a two million dollar yeah. problem, or more? Mm -hmm. if, if I may, oh, I'm sorry. If I may add, Council President. Without having the street fair, that the downtown alliance's revenues are dropped by fifteen, twenty thousand yeah. dollars. So, yeah. and the budget is built upon the street fair too. So, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, anything else from my colleagues? Okay. Well, we. Pre uh, uh, Council Council President, I have one question for Mr. Gross. Go, go, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Mr. Gross. Um, Talking about, you know, we look about expenditures and, and reductions. That what about our capital programs? What is the status of the ability to follow through on our capital expenditures? Uh, we're, we're doing some of it now. We're still continuing whatever what some projects that we can now. Um, we have not finalized a capital budget for this year because we haven't finalized a lot of stuff. You know, this throws a this throws a, a a monkey wrench into the whole process. So I don't have an answer for you now, but in terms of, we are moving on our existing capital projects wherever, to the best of our ability that we can. 
Right. Uh, but, you know, they are allowed. They were not precluded to continue. Uh, so we're, we're continuing with them. Right. Are, are, are you repositioning the, the uh, priorities of the capital projects predominantly to make sure we focus on the uh, projects that benefit our uh, town employees, particularly our police and fire, particularly roofing uh, and uh, bathroom renovations? Not important right now. Uh, I mean, my, our, 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 funds, our funds are dedicated based on the ordinances that are in there. So, you know, they have to be, Funds have to be used for the purposes for which they were were uh, um, promulgated, and so we can't and we can't reallocate them to other uses. Having said that, you know, we are moving forward with those projects, you know, because they were approved by the council, and those projects we are moving forward with. Them. Okay, thank you, Mr. Gross. Thank you, Council President. Uh, you're welcome. Okay, Madam Clerk, I, I see we do not have an ABC hearing this evening. Correct. Okay. Okay. Uh, before we adjourn, I ask for a motion for adjournment. Or uh, adjournment. Um, our next meeting is Tuesday, May twelfth, six thirty. Uh, instructions will be posted uh, the Friday before at westorange.org. So we thank all of you who have been listening in this evening. I still see there's some participants still out there. We appreciate, appreciate you uh, hanging in there with us for the past couple hours. We hope we provided some very needed information to you. Uh, this will be um, uploaded. So if you know anyone out there has not seen the uh, presentation to TV 36 and 45, and um, we, we all our prayers go out to everyone Please stay safe. Please stay informed. And uh, again, we're still our hearts and uh, thoughts going out to all the families affected uh, by this uh, pandemic. But to my colleagues, it was nice seeing you this evening. And, Same here. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and administration, thank you for all your hard work and working so hard. I, I know this has been not only uh, very emotional uh, on all of you, and, and we, we appreciate all your efforts. Um, can I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Okay. Motion to leave the meeting. <laughs> all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, and stay safe, Aye. West Orange. Thank Good you. Night, everybody. Good thank night. you, Lauren. No problem. You, Lauren. No <laughs> problem at all. Just to remind you, this will end the meeting for everyone, attendees and panelists, and you will not be able to speak to each other uh, through this medium. Thank you very much. Have a great night. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Good night.